please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we get underway, there are a number of administrative matters that I want to take care of. First off, the fire exit is located to your left. In the event of a fire, you will be notified. If so notified, please move in a calm and orderly fashion to the exit. Do not use the elevators. Use either the north or the south stairs to leave the building. The meetings are being recorded by our secretary, Michelle, for the purpose of a record in minutes. So when you come to the microphone each time, please identify yourself with your name and your address so that she can clearly record who is speaking. She is producing minutes, not a transcript, but she needs you to do that to help her out. We follow the items in the order that they appear on the agenda. Extra copies are available on the table next to the door. Once the case has been called, the applicant and or their representative will come to the podium, identify himself or herself, state their address, pause to raise their right hand and be sworn, and then present their case. During the presentation of the applicant's uh, request, the members of the board have an opportunity to ask questions or engage in discussion with the applicant. Once that process is completed, then we will open it up to the public input. Anyone wishing to address the board regarding this application should come to the podium, identify themselves along with their address, and direct their questions and comments to the board, not to the applicant. There is no interaction between applicants and people here to speak only between the applicant and the board and those who wish to speak can address their comments to the board, not to each other, not to the applicant. If we, we haven't had much of a problem in the past, but I see that there are a number of people here tonight. If there is disruptive behavior, you will be asked to leave. So please keep that in mind. Once the public input portion is divided into three portions. The first, those who wish to speak in favor of the application. The second is those who wish to speak in opposition to the application. The third is those who wish to speak to the application but are not either in favor or opposed. After all of the those who wish to be heard have been heard, we will close the case, move on to the next item on the agenda. Once all the cases have been heard, the board will take a recess and then return to deliberate each case in the order that they appear on the agenda and for which the applicants remain present. No further input is allowed during that point, this part of the meeting, unless it is specifically requested uh, by the board. You're welcome to leave or stay for that portion of the meeting. If you wish to stay and are curious as to what the results are, you can either uh, catch it on the cable, I think it's channel 1300, or you can call the Office of the Planning and Zoning Department tomorrow morning after 9 a.m. Now, what I, I want to explain, I know that there are a number of people here for the uh, app, couple of the applications, uh, and I want to make something clear, particularly with respect to the uh, application pertaining to 3000 uh, East Ridge Road. There are two types of variances that are recognized under the town law. The first is a use variance. The second is an area variance. A use variance requires the, authorizes the board, or authorizes the, if the board grants a use variance, it authorizes the uh, owner of the property to engage in a use that is not otherwise permitted under the zoning law. It requires an extreme uh, high threshold uh, of proof and it, uh, an area variance on the other hand relates to use of land in a manner that, uh, or an area variance relates to dimensional or physical requirements of structures or 
items on a piece of property. I understand that the town has determined that the application pertaining to 3000 East Ridge Road is an area variance, not a use variance. So the comments should be directed to the area variance, which is the location of the south wall and the distance from the south wall to the property line. That is the issue that is in front of us. I understand that there is a lot of opposition and people who are opposed to the use of this property that's proposed. That is not before us. That is not what we are here for tonight. So please address your comments to the wall. That is what it is. In considering that area variance, we are required to consider the following factors. First, whether the location of that wall will create an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood or a detriment to nearby properties if the variance is granted. Whether the benefit sought by the applicant can be achieved by some method feasible for the applicant to pursue other than an area variance. Whether the requested area variance is substantial. Whether the proposed variance will have an adverse effect or impact on the physical or environmental conditions in the neighborhood or district. Whether the alleged difficulty was self-created, which consideration is relevant to the decision but is not necessarily preclude the granting of the area variance. There will be an opportunity for all of you who wish to speak to provide comment on these requests tonight. If you'd like to speak, we ask that you sign up on the sign-up sheet it's not required that you sign up, but those who do will be called to speak first in the order in which their names appear. Applicants will present their applications and field questions from the board. After we've heard from the applicant, as I've said, we'll open it up to the public hearing. Uh, each individual will be given no more than five minutes to speak. If you're unable to communicate all of your comments during that five minutes, you can reduce the remainder to writing and submit that uh, to the board in writing after you've had a chance to speak. Uh, once everybody who's signed up on the sign-up sheet has uh, been given the opportunity to speak, then those who have not signed up will be given the opportunity. There is no limit on the number of people who are allowed to speak. If there are a large number who wish to speak and we're here uh, very late tonight, we may very well adjourn and resume the public hearing at a later date. But everyone who is interested will be given the opportunity to provide comment. Finally, uh, during the recess, Please do not approach any members of the board. Uh, everything is done here uh, and should not be questioned as to what discussions might be taking place out in the hall between people and members of the board. Also, the one, um, one final comment. As you can see, there are four members of the board who are here tonight. Our board is comprised of seven members. In order for a quorum to be present, there are four members need to be present. We have a quorum tonight so we can conduct business. In order for a variance application to be granted, all four members tonight must agree to the variance. So if you are an applicant and believe that there may be some um, difference of opinion among members of the board, if you do not adjourn your request tonight and we continue and one member or more does not agree with the variance, by law it is deemed to have been denied and it cannot be brought back before us for another year. So if, you, uh, if any applicant feels that perhaps they should want to have a full complement of the board present to hear their application, and all the public comment 
and consider it, this would be the time to approach uh, the desk and let them know that you would like to have your case called on another night. With that, we'll take the first case on the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First item on the agenda is case number ZB 2023-07-01. Request by Kamara Masavo for an area of variance to construct a one-story addition with less than required rear setback on premises 1884 North Goodman Street in an R2 residential district. You can approach the podium. Hello, everybody. Is your name, sir? My name is uh, Kamara Masevo. And your address? 1884 North Goodman Street. If you'd raise your right hand. The other right hand. The, your right hand. That's your left hand. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Do you swear or affirm that everything you say tonight will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay. It. You would like to... Add a one-story addition on the back of your house. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And you need a variance for? So you can put your arm down. Oh, I'm sorry. You can put your arm down. Okay. No, you can put your arm down. Oh. <laughs> so you, you want to add on to the back of your house? Yes. Two bedrooms and a full bath? Yes. And in order to make it spacious enough you need to be with uh, closer to the rear lot line than would otherwise be allowed is that correct yes All right. and what you're asking for is to be allowed to be 20 feet from the rear line instead of 30 feet correct okay right yes for a variance of 10 feet yeah okay any mem questions from anyone on the board I, I imagine that most of these people are not here about your application, but if there's anyone who wishes to speak in favor of this application, please come forward. If there's anyone here who wishes to speak in opposition to this application, please come forward. Anyone who'd like to talk to us about additions or anything else relating to the application but is neither for or opposed should come forward now. Seeing none, we'll close the hearing with respect to this matter. Thank you, sir. We'll thank move you. on to the next case on the agenda. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Case number ZB 2023-07-02. Request by Bert and Mary Beth Patton for an area of variance to install side yard fencing exceeding maximum permitted height on premises 46 Westgate Drive in an R1 residential district. It's uh, Bart Patton, and I'm at 46 Westgate Drive. And I'm Mary Beth Patton at 46 Westgate Drive. You raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm that everything you say tonight will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. Am I correct that you want to put up a six-foot fence running along where the four-foot chain link fences now that's closest to Westgate? Well, if you notice, there's, there was also a six foot stockade fence there. There were two fences that there at one time. Well, I, I, when I went there Sunday afternoon, there was one fence. Because I took the six foot fence down. Okay, all right, so. Yes, we want to put a six foot fence back where it was. Where the stockade fence was? Yeah. Which right. is exactly where the fence that you saw was, where the chain link fence was. We want to take the chain link down and put a, a six-foot fence there instead. And if I'm looking at the survey right, you're, you want to run that fence from the corner of the house to the corner of the lot right up against the, the right-of-way on the road. Is that right? Yes, sir. And the reason for that is? Uh, privacy, we just uh, also installed a pool. 
Well, I saw that you installed the pool, which is substantially recessed behind your house. Yes, sir. So my question is, the ordinance would allow you to put a six-foot fence from the, I think it would be the northwest corner of your home, up to the property line. And that would give you privacy with respect to your pool. It would leave a large area, admittedly, in the front between the street and that fence, but it would give you the privacy that you want for your pool. But it would also block off my patio that's been there. You'd have that in the front yard then. Yeah. Well, why couldn't I just replace the six-foot fence that was there, that was there for all those years when I bought the house? Well, did you have, was there a permit or a variance issued for the six-foot fence that was there? That's why I'm here now, sir. No, there wasn't. Okay. Well, that's the reason, because the ordinance doesn't allow it. The fact that somebody put it up without a permit and without a variance doesn't mean that it's okay to have it there. That's why we're here today. I understand that. And one of the things that we're looking at, it, I'm going to be honest with you, a six-foot vinyl fence where you want to put it, solid fence, is like a wall. And there are no other walls that I see in your neighborhood. Right across the street, sir. There's a stockade, There's a stockade, stockade fence. fence there. Behind the house, where you're allowed to put it. And yes, on List Avenue, there are two stockade fences that run together, both in backyards, both that are allowed under the, the ordinance. I, I, I don't, um, what I, I'm kind of confused is, it would look much better with the fence on the front where it had been before than to push it back and then I'd have that patio sitting out there basically in my front yard. All I'm asking for is a two-foot difference to replace something that in my, when I bought the house, I had no idea knowing that the fence was illegal until I started this whole process. And that fence has, I've been in the house tw more than 20 years and no one complained about the fence before that, so... I think for the aesthetics of the neighborhood, instead of having that ugly now patio in the front yard, it would stay in the backyard. But there, there is ground footage in front of the fence. There's a substantial amount because there's grass and two trees in front of the fence that's on our property as well. I'm looking at the survey map that, and what you've drawn on the survey map shows that going right up to the edge of the right of way, which is the edge of your property. Yes. Right. So it, normally there'd be a setback requirement, which would be in addition to the right of way from the actual pavement. Very few fences go right up to the property line, our, at least not in the front. Well, our four foot fence goes up. I mean, it follows that same line right now. Right. The, the four foot fence with an open um, pattern, like the chain link, chain link, is permitted. Well, three and a half is. So that, and the reason is to keep things open and looking open as opposed to walled off. It, I'll tell you though, being in the backyard, like when we are in the pool, it feels kind of like a fishbowl because we have a lot of dog walkers in that, so everyone can look in and watch us be in the pool. So I agree. You know, it's kind of a privacy thing. I understand that. And as I said, if you run a fence from the northwest corner of your house or if you fence put a fence around the, the patio and then run it over from the corner of the patio, to the side of the yard, you'll have privacy for your pool. But it just doesn't aesthetically, it won't aesthetically look like right because of the way the house sits on the lot. Yeah, it sits odd on the whole, because it's angled onto the lot. This will be much nicer looking. I think everyone on the street, there's no one here to, I don't believe, to say anything against it. I Most of my neighbors come out and go, that's a great idea. You're making that look so much nicer. And, all, and again, it was there. I, I'm sorry that they didn't get the permit for it. Do you have photographs that show the stockade fence that, where it was that you could submit to us? Cause, yes. All right. I mean, I know you don't have them tonight. We don't but, have them tonight, but we can show you. Because I'd be interested in seeing what it looked like. It was an ugly black. Was, no, I know it's ugly, but stockade fences by their nature tend to be ugly after about two or three years. Yeah. That's why he took it down in the first place. Mm -hmm. It was completely falling apart, and that's when he found the chain link fence. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd like, I'm personally, I can't speak for anybody else on the board, but I'm interested in, in seeing what it looked like with the stockade fence there, and we can 
you know, we don't have to do the fancy computer stuff to substitute white vinyl. We can figure that out with our imaginations. Okay. Because we grew up at a time when we fostered our imaginations. So, um, you know, we, we can do that. Uh, and also, I, I'd be interested in uh, seeing if you have uh, any other alternatives that would require not so much of a variance in terms of the fencing. Okay? As in the six foot or the location of it? The location. I understand the reason that you want the six feet. That that's very clear. I mean, when I when I drove by and was looking at things on Sunday afternoon, it was very clear somebody was in the pool. Uh, you know, I saw people going around and things. I I have no question at all as to why you would want privacy for your pool. It's just a question of where the fence would be. All right, so you're looking for photographs of what it was like What before? it looked like when the stockade fence was there. Okay. All right? Because my concern is that it's going to look like we've walled off that section of Westgate Drive. Picture of it. Oh. oh, I have a picture of it. Okay. Jim, this seems like it's very similar to the one that we did on Winona and Colwood. Yes, it does. That's why I'm... That's a stockade fence? Yes. Yes, that's a stockade fence right behind that black fence. That black is the stockade fence. Yes, sir. The six foot stockade fence. That's a six foot stockade fence. Yes, And your, that picture shows the fence across the street as well, which, as I said earlier, that's a rear fence as opposed to a front fence. So you want to replace it with a white vinyl six-foot fence? Just because behind yes. us is a white vinyl fence, so we thought it would look better for them to match than to put in anything else. I saw that you had that on the back side, yeah. So we want to try and match it up so it looks aesthetically better. And... Are you planning on running a fence down along the north side of the property? No, all the, that's the only fence. No, the, that, everything else is staying exactly the way it is. All right. And remind me, are those trees still there? I, I, I drove by yesterday, but I, I just no, don't No, those remember. trees were taken down. The ones that are on my property, yes. Those yeah, trees have trees been removed. The trees behind the fence are gone, but the trees in front of the fence are still there. Right. So would, would this fence run behind the trees that are there by the sidewalk? Yes. Absolutely. Yes, about ten, it's about ten, feet, about 10 feet behind those trees. Behind the trees. Right, that's right. Where, if you were there on Sunday, it's, that's exactly where that chain link fence runs now. All right. Yeah, I, understand. I have a picture of that if you'd like to see if that helps. No, I took a picture when I was there Sunday so I could refresh my recollection. Okay. So when you say 10 to 15 feet behind, you're including the sidewalk and the grass area that's part of the right-of-way up to the pavement, right? Right. There's nothing between the road and the sidewalk. There's no trees there. No, I know. It's behind that. Right. That's about, yeah. From the sidewalk to 15, the 15, 20 feet. feet. Yeah, because you used to mow it. And um, the reason that... You couldn't put the fence from the patio and then run it over to the north line has, so it's further set back would be what? You, you mean that part that drops up into the corner, move that part back? No. When okay. I'm looking at your survey map. May I approach so you can show me? So I know yeah. I'm... On the northwest corner. Uh -huh. If you 
you ran it from there and then ran it that way instead of at an angle. You mean bring this in this far? Mm -hmm. How far would you like me to bring that in? Just so that it's parallel with the, the road. It actually is parallel with the road now because we're at the end of the cul-de-sac, so yeah, it's following the road. That's this is the right of way. Right. So if you went from here to there, you'd have the privacy, and we wouldn't have the wall up against the, and I know your neighbor has one, but as I said, that's legal. So you, you think that that's going to make the difference? Huh? It, it's still a wall. Still a wall, but it's so, a wall that's set back. We had a similar issue over on Winona Boulevard a few years ago. Okay. I guess I would, you would have to tell me that how much you want, it would, you would allow me to come back that way, if that's all right. Because you sound like that's, that's what you're already willing to approve, essentially. It would need to go straight from that northwest corner to the, to the line, the shortest distance from the, that corner to the property line to the north. Be like this. No, I understand. I, I, I completely understand. I'm just trying to think. Of it's going to be the shortest distance. If that you would like to do, I guess I, I, I'm here. That gives you your privacy, right? And that's the objective, right? Just bringing it. Straight this way. Which is fine, but our next door neighbors, then the it's not going to come to the corner of their chain link fence. It's going to set back from their chain link fence. So their chain link fence will be in front of us. Yeah, ours. that would look ugly for them. We're trying to make it look. They would have to look out and see that fence and then that big gap on the other side of theirs. I'm sure they wouldn't appreciate that. Well, let me suggest this to you. I think that Mr. Trevis, at least, and myself, would like to look at this some more. Can we stop by your place? We'll catch you when you're home and talk to you about it. Let's do walk it. Sure. All right, and then we'll come back in, uh, what's this, is July already? Wow, we'll come back in August? Sure. Okay, all right. Is there anyone here who wanted to speak to this application? Step right up. No, we don't, only the applicants get sworn. Because the, we had a situation several years ago where an applicant uh, gave us information and made representations during a hearing that turned out to be inaccurate and or false. And we found out that because they were not sworn, there was no real remedy uh, available to prevent that. So. By swearing in the witnesses, if, wit if the applicants provide information that is false, there is legal recourse then because they were giving sworn testimony that was false. People who are here to address applications are not applicants, and they're allowed to express their opinion, whether it's grounded in reality or not. All right, well, my name is Rachel Krug. I live at 28 Westgate Drive, right next door. Um, we're in- To so the north or the south? South. South, okay. Um, and we're actually in favor of the fence because we have a very young community right now. We've got a lot of younger kids that are moving in and to have that consistency of the fence makes a really big difference. There's really very few sidewalks that are on our street. There's like a whole, there's two portions of it that don't have sidewalks, and it's the Westgate end portion that has sidewalks. And there's lots of kids in that area. To have the consistency of the fence, I think almost just kind of keeps kids in that designated area going up and down the sidewalks and keeps them out of the backyards where something could potentially happen. I mean, anybody who's had a kid knows that they can jump fences. Oh, yeah. So yeah. we're definitely in favor of the fence. Um, we have a white porch and think it would go along lovely with it. Okay. So, thank thank you. you. Anyone else wish to address this application? Step right up, sir. I'm Jay Rickard. 
I live the other side. I live 64 Westgate Drive. The, the north side. The north side, that is correct. Okay. Uh, I think the way they have it planned out is go to the corner of my property, up by the sidewalk, to the corner of their garage. That's what I would do. Having the fence cut down so it has more variance from the road, aesthetically, I don't think it would look correct. Okay. And I'm in favor of the fence. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else wish to speak to this application? Seeing none, we'll close. Well, we'll no, we'll leave this open, this one, and we'll adjourn it to uh, the August meeting. Um, Mr. Patton, is that right? All right. So, uh, I think your number, your phone number is on the application, correct? Yes, sir. All right. So we'll be in touch with you to set up a time when we can come and look at it, talk to you more about it. Okay. All right. Thank you. He agreed to, okay. to put it off to August. Okay. All right. And Can we I can. Reapply, sir? No, no. Your application is still open. You don't have to pay another fee. You don't have to fill out more paperwork. Okay. All right. So the next item on the agenda. Next case on the agenda is case number ZB 2023-07-03. Request by Robert and Lori France for an area variance to reconstruct a two-story dock with less than required front setback waterfront on premises 359 Bay Front Lane North in an R2 residential district. Robert France, 359 Bay Front Lane North. Do you swear or affirm that everything you say tonight will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. You're looking to expand your deck? I am. I was a little confused when I was there Sunday. It didn't look like anyone was home, so I couldn't ask. But um, I was unclear as to what it is that you are looking to expand it. Is it. Are you going out further to the water? Going two, Both decks will go out two feet further to the water. And the second floor deck, which is more than a, a modified walkway out, will now cover the first floor deck, the lower deck, I should say. All right, so the, the second floor that looked like a... A, a walkway out. Yeah. Right, correct. Like a landing. Correct. That's going to be a whole deck now. That's correct. Okay. Because what happens is that after 30-some after years, it's all deteriorating, it's got to be redone. So what we've learned from living the last 12 years is the fact that, number one, when it starts raining, we got no protection. We have an awning for sun. But when it rains, it kind of kills the party and we're all done. So this way here, we figure since we're doing it, let's just cover it so we can utilize it more often. And in the other, uh, one thing I do want to bring the attention of the board, though, that uh, if they had my exhibits here, there's a, there's a mistake here. The upper deck will cover the walkway also. I show it not covering the walkway and it's brought to my attention. So instead of 18 feet wide, it'll be 22.5 feet wide which covers the walkway, the existing walkway. All the existing walkways and landings and staircases all are exactly the same from the previous uh, variants. All right, so you're not going closer to the water. I am not. You're, you're just going. I'm just carving the walkway. You're, you're basically doing a double-decker deck. Correct. OK. And it's going to wrap around the house to the side entrance. Right, as it presently is. OK. No, no modifications there. All right. Thirty years ago, they didn't have all the treks and stuff that they have now. That mm -hmm. trying to make it maintenance free as possible. And the pressure treated only had a twenty-year warranty, which which expired. Which is yeah, <laughs> I found that out myself. <laughs> Any questions uh, from the board? And I take it you're going with treks over the Correct. top? And all vinyl, all the beams will be uh, pressure and wrapped in vinyl, so it's, everything is going to be totally maintenance free. Okay, thank you. Finally. 
get to an age where that becomes a real advantage. My wife thinks so. Yep. <laughs> Is there uh, anyone here to speak in favor of this application? Step right up, sir. Chris Wall at 361 Bayfront Lane North, just to the north of their property, and I'm in favor. I think it's going to look nice. They've done great work and great work with the property, so I'm in favor of it. All right. Thank you, sir. Anyone else who wishes to speak in favor of the application? Anyone who wishes to speak in opposition of the application? Anyone who'd like to talk to us about decks or anything else related to the application? Yes, sir. I also did inform the neighbor to the south exactly what I was doing, and he was fine with that also. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. We'll close the hearing with respect to this matter and move on to the next uh, matter on the agenda. Case number ZB 2023-07-04. Request by Ellen Gruber and Sarah Eck for area variances to reconstruct an existing deck with less than required front and side setbacks on premises 162 Schnackel Drive in an R3 residential district. Ellen Gruber, 162 Schnackel Drive. You'd raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that everything you say tonight will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay, thank you. Would you like me to explain what sure. we're doing? Uh, the existing deck sounds like a similar situation. The wood's given out, and uh, I just uh, power washed the whole thing myself a few years ago, repainted it all, and everything's starting to peel. And it's like, I just don't want to go through this every three years. I want to upgrade it and um, new materials. And as we're thinking about it and planning that, it's like, well, it would be nice if we could just extend this a little bit more to get a little bit more deck space. Didn't realize it required the whole variance in shebang, because basically the footprint of the deck is the same. Um, but uh, we're ex expanding a little bit to the uh, south end of the deck. Um, and as we're squaring, squaring it off and wrapping it around the um, the edge of the house a little bit so that it will be actually level with the house or even with the house. Um, we're just gaining a little bit of a, a floor space since it's a very, very well used deck. It's a second floor deck. It's actually sort of a first floor deck, but below it is a, um, is a sunken patio. Um, so, uh, so it's actually, uh, it comes out on the living room and it is, you know, it is facing the water. Um, so uh, everything's going to be basically upgraded. The railings are going to be, uh, you know, new, and it's uh, it's a it's a very nice upgrade. We're not adding a lot of square footage, um, but it does ex extend the f the um, the deck closer toward in that one particular corner, closer towards the bay. Um, so that's the that's the reason that we need this variance is for that. Uh, that front setback. Uh, the the problem with that, you know, the existing deck is also built um, a, a, basically a little bit close to the deck that had nothing, or close to the bay that had nothing to do with ours. So we we're just sort of replicating that um, and and extending the, that south uh, that southeast corner, which puts you closer to the water because the water it juts into the west. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And you, you and all your neighbors go in and out of there every day, huh? In and out of Schnackle Drive. That's uh, quite a place to go to. It's a, it's a it's a daily adventure. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions or comments from the board? Good. Seeing none, is there anyone here to speak in favor of this application? Anyone here to speak in opposition to this application? Anyone here who'd like to talk about the application that's neither for it nor against it? Seeing none, we'll close the hearing with respect to this matter. Move on to the next item on the uh, agenda. Case number PB. 2023-07-05, request by Brian Hartman. I'm sorry, you mean ZB? ZB. ZB. 
Good catch, sir. Thank you. My apologies. That's fine. Case number ZB 2023-07-05. Request by Brian Hartman, acting as agent for Dan Conrad, for an area variance to construct a new deck with less than required rear setback on premises 262 Teakwood Drive in an R2 residential district. Hi, Brian Hartman, 262 Teakwood Drive. You swear or affirm that everything you say tonight will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. So you want to put a second-story deck on the back of your house? Yes. So you have a nice view of the traffic on 104? Well, it's nice. It's building with trees now. When you sit back there now, it's really closed off with the trees. All right. You know, so... So we're going to put a door out this back where there's a window to walk out on it so they don't have to go down to the, cause the hills. There's a hill on the back of the house. I was there Sunday and can't remember her name. Showed me all around. Oh, uh, I there's two of them there. Which one? I, I'm bad with names too. <laughs> I don't know. I know Dan. That's the one. That's our person. I think that's who it was. Dan was there. Dana. No, no, Dan. Dan's the guy who I'm doing the job. No, for. it's not Dan. His. It's his a woman. I think it's his, I think it's his sister there sometimes. Whoever. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Anyway, she showed me where you're going to put, take the window out, put a door in, yeah. the deck and everything. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we just like to go 12 foot deep because 9 foot to where it would be the setback is pretty shallow for a deck. And yeah. there's nothing behind it. It's all the state land and there's a fence and stuff, so there's nobody that's affected. You don't even have an access road behind you there, right? No. Just the state property yeah. Yeah, the, up the to 104. The and the trees, and then that's it. Okay. So. What are you using for the decking material? I didn't see. I use ASIC material. It's a track, so it's equal to track. Okay. Yeah. I just let and me vinyl inside. railings, like I think I saw. Huh? Vinyl railings going yep, around? Vinyl railings, yep. That's a steep slope. Going yeah, it's going it to run is. over with one level, drop down two steps, and then go over to the to where it meets the ground. Yeah. So they can walk over to there and go down and around the deck that way to get below it. Anyone here to speak in favor of this application? Anyone here to speak in opposition to this application? Anyone who wants to talk us about decks or anything to do with this? Seeing none, we'll close the hearing with respect to that matter. Move on to the next item on the agenda. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Next item is case number ZB 2023-07-06. Request by Heidi Scorson for an area variance to maintain an existing accessory structure hot tub located within the front yard waterfront on premises 179 Lakefront in an R2 residential district. Heidi Scorson, 179 Lakefront Drive. Do you swear or affirm that everything you say tonight will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, I bought the property over two and a half, over two years ago. It did have an existing hot tub. Um, I didn't realize they never got a permit or a variance. It is in the backyard, but it's considered the front yard because it's on the water. Um, according to one of the neighbors, the hot tub's been there for almost 20 years. Um, I'm just asking for a variance. Um, to keep the hot tub. Um, I do have the survey here um, from before I bought it, and it shows the hot tub on the survey. Um, just, just so you know that I didn't install it illegally. I didn't know they didn't get a permit. Um, the neighbors, I guess, did mention in one of the letters saying that it didn't have a lock. Um, I can show you um, pictures of the safety locks that were installed. If you can hand them to Mr. Antini and he'll pass them down to the rest of us. Thank you. Um, there were complaints um, over a year ago about noise after 10 o'clock. We are installing an off switch after 10 o'clock, so the hot tub will not be in use. 10 p.m., I'm sorry. In that picture, is that just straps going down, or is there a way to unlock them and lock them? There's locks on the bottom. It's um, hard to if see you see, I can I can bring better pictures tomorrow if that's. But the locks are um, approved through. Okay. Or I can send via email if that's okay. 
my printer wasn't working very well. And those those were recently installed, those locks? Yeah, unfortunately I didn't realize the other one broke, a couple of them broke, so we did fix. Um, like I said, I know the neighbor's concern was they have grandchildren and about the locks, so we installed them. We do live, we do live on the water, so um, I would hope that, you know, they watch their grandchildren regardless, because it is waterfront. Um, but we do have locks on them. And then I, I see from a picture that you're, was submitted, a, I think, by the neighbor, that you now have uh, what appears to be a shower curtain running where the fence had been. Um, yeah, that's going to be taken down. I have a, a guy coming to um, put trees up there. Okay. Again, the previous neighbor put a fence up um, two sections without a permit, so we're taking those down, and I have arborvitaes coming in. Okay. Right. And the reason that you want the hot tub in the front yard is? Well, it's, it's, I don't have a backyard because the front yard is the lakefront, I guess. So I asked if I could put a hot tub in the front yard, but they said I technically I have two front yards. And no backyard. No backyard. Okay. Any other questions from the board? All right. Seeing none, is there anyone here who wishes to speak in favor of this application? Anyone who wishes to speak in opposition to this application? Step right up, sir. Good evening. My name is David Stabley. I live at 175 Lakefront, immediately to 179 West. The hot tub in question is not locked. It has straps on it that you unbuckle just like a life jacket. My five-year-old and my seven-year-old have a hot tub adjoining property. They can easily snap a hot tub open on their hot tub, the same type of latches that she has. It's not locked. It's left unattended, open and unattended for hours, sometimes days. The most recent was when the cleaners came to clean up after the last renter, and they were cleaning out the hot tub, left it unattended, hose running, overflowed, nobody in sight to watch it. There are five children under the age of seven within 100 feet of her home. There are children up and down the neighborhood. Children, yes, we watch our children very carefully, but children do things. No. I'm sorry. Comments are addressed to the board, not to the applicant. I'm sorry. So, uh, as far as safety, I find it to be a real safety issue. There's nothing stopping anyone from walking up that front yard and opening up that hot tub and hopping in, regardless of how old they are. That house goes empty for days. Anybody could use that hot tub. There's nothing keeping it. And when the tenants are there renting, sometimes they take the top off and leave it open for days. All night. And I don't think it's safe. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else here to speak in opposition to this application? Anyone here to speak to the application who's neither in favor or opposed? Would the applicant? Oh, sure. I'm just wondering, would a variance be required if all things being equal except for no water in the front yard um, if it was just land back there wood, wooded area so it would not be a front yard would a variance be required no because it wouldn't be a front yard then the okay. the one of the things in the in the ordinance is that waterfront property the front is defined as facing the water and yet it's also facing the road so as she pointed out, waterfront properties have two front yards and no backyard. Thank you. They're looking at, my understanding is they're taking a look at all the definitions in the, in the zoning ordinance that create issues like this about fences and front and side yards and corner lots and a lot of the things that we deal with on a regular basis. Thank you. 
You're welcome. Did the applicant wish to address the board further? Yes, I did go to two swimming pool places and made sure they were the appropriate locks. They told me they were approved. Um, for some reason, I can send pictures and, and get that data to you guys. Um, do they have a key? Um, I believe they do. If they, I believe they do. But I, like I said, if they're not, we'll switch them out to the appropriate. Um, that's what they told me, that it was, it was approved, but I will make sure. All right. Well, that would require us coming back on this in August. Okay. All right. Do I have to come back here or just show you the paperwork? No, you would need to come back, back. in August. Okay. Okay? That would be the first Monday in August, which would be the... Seventh, sixth, August seventh, August seventh, sir. August seventh. Okay. I, I'm sorry. You would just want me to bring the key, and the that's showing that it's a. Well, I'd, I'd like to see a really good picture of what the lock mechanism okay. is, because okay. the issue that's raised is that this is not an owner-occupied property, so that hot tub sits there for periods of time, and if it's not locked, uh, then it the, the issue is that it creates a hazard. So okay. uh, if it's just a, a little thing that clips in that all you have to do is snap it off and, it, and it's open, yeah. th that's really not a lock. Okay, well, we'll make sure that it, it actually, I, I, the one I looked at it did, but I want to make sure. Um, I do, we do have family members that stay there a lot, um, a month or so at a time in the summer. So I just wanted to let you know we do, you know, come there quite often um, and as far as um, the lock we'll make sure that I'll bring the information next, next okay. with better pictures is there a way I can email the pictures just in case my printer yes you can email them to uh, and I'll do that ahead of time Michelle and or you can drop them off to the okay. town hall up on the floor above us is where their offices are okay great thank you very much you're very welcome Next item on the agenda, we'll close the hearing with respect to that matter and move on to the next item on the agenda. Next case on the agenda is case number ZB 2023-07-07. Request by Stantec Consulting Services, Inc., acting as agent for Rochester Gas and Electric for area variances to reconstruct the existing electric substation with less than required rear setback and installation of a non-conforming fence type on premises 40 Topper Drive in a C business district. Good afternoon, board members. Uh, Thomas Palumbo, Stanta Consulting Services. Uh, and and I'm Megan Yoshida on behalf of our g and &E. If you'd both raise your right hands, do you swear or affirm that everything you say tonight will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Okay. So, um, we have in front of you an application for uh, a couple of variances. Uh, t this will allow us to, uh, to rebuild uh, Station 51 on 40 Topper Drive. Uh, real important station, it serves about 2,300 customers uh, in the area. And uh, this will really kind of help maintain the reliability uh, as well as the security of the site. So we have um, proposed what we have out there right now, if, if you looked at that, um, that fact sheet that we had, we had provided as part of our application, kind of gives you an idea of what it looks like out there right now with the existing uh, gear that's incorporated. Um, so what we're going to be doing is we'll be installing or building a control house, which will house the new switches. So all that gear that's out, out in the open right now will go inside the control house. Okay. Then we'll also build a new transformer, which will have a wall around it. Two, two transformers. Two transformers. Um, the, uh, the site will get new, new, new fencing around it. Uh, it currently is all eight foot fence, um, except for the section mm -hmm. along the east property line. Uh, we're gonna replace the north and east sides with chain link, eight foot chain link fence um, that's currently there with barbed wire. And then the topper roadside and the other angle, we're gonna use a decorative metal fence. 
but you're still going to have the barbed wire at the top going all the way around. Not the decorative. The decorative uh, fence doesn't have barbed wire on it. It has a, a bend it with a, bend with a prongs, point. Prongs on top, like a trident structure. Right. So it's a, a security kind of fencing. Correct. It's definitely, yeah. I think it's similar to the fence that they put around portions of the Civic Center Plaza next to the Hall of Justice, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and really, our the oh, I'm looking at this picture that was with the uh, submitted with the materials. Mm -hmm. I don't know what a transformer is versus a switch. <laughs> All I know is there's a lot of stuff that looks like I'd probably get hurt if I touched it. Oh yeah, <laughs> you're correct. Yeah. yeah. Right, so, what is it that's still going to be outside? Well, what has to happen is they need to build the new equipment before they can take off the old equipment. That's, right. why, that's why we're kind of separate. Otherwise, 2,300 people won't have power for a few months. Right. Sea breeze, not good. So basically everything is underground between the, between the control house and the, tran this is the transformer section in here. So the transformers are inside these walls. I'll show you that. So to answer your question, the transformer is essentially a big box with little cylinder items that stick up on top. And I lied, this station does only have one. Um, there will be a wall around it, a noise wall. So you will only be able to see it in this render from specific angles. Um, everything that's outdoors right now is going away at the culmination of the project. And all of the equipment except that one transformer will be inside that control house. Okay. A little more aesthetically pleasing. And I do have copies of these renderings for, for the file. I, I did, were they submitted with the application? Because I don't recall seeing them. They were not. Okay. They were not. All right. Do you have copies? Smaller ones? Okay, good. So we think, uh, you know, that this turns out to be a, a really good benefit for the, for the community. We maintain system reliability, maintain our security, uh, and the safety around the, around the site. Plus, we get to take some of that equipment out of, out of eyesight, basically. Now, we do, you know, recognize we have that rear setback to contend with. And it's kind of difficult with the odd shape of the lot. And this is really our front setback in here, so this becomes our back, our back setback, our rear setback. Um. Yeah, two items I wanted to note is that we originally had chain link fence around the station with the barbed wire on top, and we initially at the start of this project met with Arundaquite staff, and they asked if we could potentially change the fence, so we upgraded at least the two sides to the decorative metal fence, the side that faces the residences, um, as well as the one on the south that you kind of see when you pull, when you pull adjacent to Topper yeah. Drive. Um, because on the east side there, it is currently a higher height next to that building. That building is a Seabreeze maintenance building. We have to have the fence higher than the roof of that building so someone couldn't go on top of the roof and then jump into the substation for yeah. safety and security reasons. So how high will that fence be? Staying the same, 15 feet. Oh, 16, 15 16, feet. Sorry, 16, 16, 16 feet. feet, okay. Yeah, we, we, uh, we provided a, an amendment to the variance letter, um, and that, that would be for this, this stretch right in here. All right. And that black decorative metal fence only goes up to 10 feet high. So part of the rationale for providing just chain link on that east and north side. Is to go higher. No, the, we can't put black metal fence on the east side because it only... It only goes, goes 10, 10, feet, 10 feet. And the chain link will let you go 16. Yeah, or higher. Right, or higher. Yeah. Yep. And we have already been in discussion with Seabreeze just on the plans as well because... This driveway that parallels Topper is actually Seabreeze property, so they're aware, they're excited, we'll be working with them for outages. 
um, and just staying in communication with them throughout this process. Okay. Yeah, so the topper is the real, the right, top right away is up on top from here. South is to the, to the left. And then this is the drive, this driveway, it's called Topper Drive East, but it's really going into their parking lot. I think it's going to be aesthetically a real good improvement as well as more power for the area, I'm assuming. So, yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Any other questions or comments from the board? Seeing none, we'll open it up to public input. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak in favor of this application? Anyone here to speak in opposition to this application? Anyone who'd like to talk to us about power and outages or anything like that? Seeing none, we'll close the hearing with respect to this matter. Move on to the next item on the agenda. Great. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Next case on the agenda is case number ZB 2023-07-08. Request by Harris Beach PLLC, acting as agent for University Preparatory Charter School for Young Men for an area of variance to maintain an existing building with less than required setback from, a, from an adjoining lot line on premises 3000 Eastridge Road in an R1 residential district. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Frank Pavi. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Harris Beach, and I represent the University Preparatory Charter School for Young Men, or UPREP. Because you're an attorney and have a lot more on the line than any other applicant, you won't be sworn, but I do have a question for you. Yes, sir. You can see you weren't here at the beginning when I uh, made this. No, uh, I was in the hallway, Mr. Chairman. I heard your comments about this is an area variance and not a use variance. No, I'm referring to my comment that there are four members of the board present tonight. We are constituted as a seven-member board. So because two members are absent, there is no room for any disagreement for an application to be granted. So and if you don't get all four votes, then it is denied and it would be a year before you'd be able to apply. So at the beginning, I indicated to all the applicants that if you wanted to come back on another night when the full board would be here and you'd have more, uh, let's say, room for error from your perspective, uh, we would give you that opportunity. But if you want to proceed, we're ready, willing, and able to do so. Well, Mr. Chairman, could we proceed with the introduction of the variance application to the board, receive the public comments, and the reserve decision for the next board meeting? Certainly. I mean, my clients are here, and that I'm would here be fine. at a cost to my applicant, as yep. well as Alex nope. Amering. That's fine. Is, I, that, that's that, perfectly fine. If we can fine. do that, then. I, I know all these people want to talk to us tonight, Correct. and uh, so we'll uh, give them that opportunity, and they may come back later and talk to us again. Sure, understood. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm here to speak in support of UPREP's application for an area advance related to the setback distance of the southeastern corner of an existing building located at 3000 Ridge Road in the town of Rondequite. UPREP's area variance application has been submitted in conjunction with my client's site plan application for the redevelopment of the former Lucian software facility located the property into a New York State accredited charter school, which is a permitted use in an R1 residential district pursuant to 235-8A3 of the town zoning law. In simplest terms, UPREP is respectfully requesting that the ZBA grant an area variance permitting a reduced 29.6 foot setback in order, to in order to permit the southeast corner of an existing building to remain as is. As an initial matter, the requested setback area variance is a type two action exempt from seeker pursuant to section 617.5C16 of the seeker regulations. By way of background, the property comprises approximately six acres located within an R1 residential district. The southern portion of the property fronts Eastridge Road, a public road, and in part Binnacle Point, a private road. The eastern portion of the property partially fronts Valley Circle, a private road. As you have noted earlier, Mr. Chairman, 
UPREP is not applying for a use variance, but an area variance. The application, nor does the, is the application concern a commercial use or the attempt to alter or expand a non-conforming use. To the contrary, pursuant to Section 235.8A3 of the Zoning Law, private, nonprofit, elementary, and secondary schools accredited by the State of New York are permitted uses in R1 residential districts, and UPREP is just that. Section 235.8A3 provides only a dimensional limitation which requires that all buildings, school buildings, be located beyond 50 feet of an adjoining lot line. Of the entire existing complex of buildings located on the property, the only area that does not meet this requirement is the southeastern portion of an existing building which is located 29.6 feet from the property's southeastern lot line. And I would respectfully refer the board members to the photo that we submitted in addition to our application that depicts the exact corner and the location. And that is essentially simple, in simple terms, what the area variance application is about. Since UPREP intends to reuse the existing building as is without an expansion of the footprint, this is the only area that requires an area variance. Now, in considering our area variance application, as you know, this board must weigh the factors set forth in section 235-101 and E of the town zoning law and section 267-B of the New York State Town Law. It is the requested setback variance of 20.4 feet that is subject to the weighing of the factors identified in the statutory provisions and not the permitted use of the property. As such, when weighing the requisite area, vari area variance factors as to the reduced 29.6 foot setback, which is 20.4 feet less than the 50 foot set uh, setback requirement, we respectfully submit that the granting of the requested area variance is both rational and warranted. First, the area variance will not result in an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood or be detrimental to nearby properties. The area variance is uh, not... There's to be no reaction to the comments, so just maintain Thank the you, core. Mr. Chairman. The area variance is not being requested to extend, expand the footprint of the building but simply to permit the 29.6 foot existing setback of the southeast corner of the building to remain in place, as it has for decades before. Moreover, an existing berm and row mature trees block the southeastern corner of the bu existing building from the view of the adjoining road. In fact, no residential properties directly adjoin the southeastern corner, southeastern corner of the existing building. Two, there are no reasonable and or feasible alternatives to the requested area advance. Because it is UPREP's intention to reuse the existing building as part of its site plan, and that this specific corner of the existing building is located within 29.6 feet of the lot line, there are no reasonable or feasible alternatives that UPREP can pursue. The only alternative is to relocate the, enti relocate the entire building, which is not only feasible to pursue because of the existing conditions of the property, but inexorbitantly costly, and would create a far greater impact to the property and the neighborhood. Thirdly, the requested area variance is not substantial. Well, the, I, I wanted to ask one thing about that. The other, all, you know, you, you say that if the variance isn't granted, the entire building would have to be relocated. If the portion of the building that the 24, 20.4 foot, foot portion of the building was removed, that would comport with the, with the 50 foot, what would that do? What impact would that have? What cost would that be entail? It's my understanding, and Alex can speak to this more informally, that corner is a supporting part of the structure. So to remove that corner would require that the building be relocated or restructured at an exorbitant cost. If it was a non-supporting corner of the building, that could be possible. Um, thirdly, the requested area of variance is not substantial. The total square footage of the buildings will be approximately 52,700 square feet, of which the southeastern portion of the building comprises only 1,225 square feet. Thus, the total area of the portion of the building that falls within the 29.6 foot setback equals only 2% of the total square footage. Plus, the southeastern corner of the existing building comprises less than 0.25 of an acre, representing only 4% of the total acreage comprising the property. 
Lastly, the requested variance of 20.4 feet represents then half of the total 50 foot setback requirement. Therefore, when taking the dimensional totality of the property and its ex existing buildings, along with the scope of the requested setback area, the area variance is not substantial. Fourthly, the area variance will not present an adverse physical environmental condition in the neighborhood or district. The requested area variance simply seeks to permit the existing building to remain in place. The 20.4 feet of variance setback is buffered by the berm and the row of mature trees. As such, there's no evidence to suggest that leaving the building in place at that setback will result in harm to the neighborhood or uh, harm to physical environmental condition of the neighborhood. And lastly, although the area variance would, could be considered self-created, that is not a bar to its approval. Self-creation in and of itself is not a bar to granting the requested area variance. This is the long-standing principle as set forth in the controlling New York State Court of Appeals decision in Sasso versus Osgood. The setback of the southeastern portion of the existing building is an inherited condition of the existing structure. And what I mean by that is it is not a new setback resulting from a new building that UPREP is, wishes to construct. To the contrary, it's an existing condition which is not substantial in nature, but now requires an area of errance pursuant to Section 235.883. Although the area variance could be considered self-created, the factor is outweighed by the benefits of permitting, allowing the existing building to remain in place as is. In reviewing this application, this board is required to engage in a balance test of weighing the benefit of keeping the southeastern corner of the building in place at the reduced setback against the harm and detriment to the health, safety, and welfare of the neighborhood community if the reduced setback is granted. However, not one of these factors is determinative in and of itself. It is a balancing test. Now, we have, Mr. Chairman, received some written public comments in response to this application before tonight. And I would respectfully submit that the vast majority, if not all of those comments, are generalized and unsubstantiated allegations that go to the future use of the property and not to the 20.4 foot set area setback variance requested for the existing building. And that there is no basis to the allegation that the future school will be a non-permitted commercial use. I know that was a claim in one of the comments. The future culinary program that would be at this school is part of the New York State accredited program UPREP will offer its students. It will not be a commercial business. Now, I know you have addressed this already, Mr. Chairman, but there, one of the other comments was an attempt to suggest that this is actually a use variance. And I'm prepared to to go through that as to why that's false. I also am prepared to uh, submit that the reliance on Colin, the Collin Realty Company decision is misplaced. Um, I'm prepared to hold that until later. I'm sure your attorney is well aware of the decision and the legal uh, principles involved in that issue. But I think with all due respect, none of the allegations contained in the comments provide specific evidence to how the reduced 29.6 foot setback per se in and of itself will be harmful to the neighborhood or the environment. Instead, the comments contain repeated allegations as to how the use proposed by UPREP will be harmful. And I respectfully submit that is not within the purview of this board's review of our areas variance application. That is more appropriately before the planning board as part of the site plan application. Lastly, any decision made by a municipal board in the town of Greece has no precedential value to the, this board's review. Therefore, when we focus the balancing of the requisite five factors on the reduced 29.6 foot setback itself, we respectfully submit that there is a rational and reasonable basis to support approval of the requested area variance. Thank you, and I'm happy to address any questions of the board. I do have one question. Um, the 50 foot seems to be limited specifically to schools as opposed to if somebody were going to use that building for um, a dance studio or something like that, um, it wouldn't apply. There would be a different setback requirement, correct? Yes, it would not. The 50 foot setback only applies to private elementary and secondary schools that would be located in the R1 district. All right, so I'm, I'm a little curious about the reasoning and the rationale in, in imposing a limit that applies only to one specific permitted use 
What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think there's precedent for other uses in other uh, districts that have similar dimensional requirements. And, but that dimensional requirement doesn't go to, as to the use and the permission of the use. It just says, your zoning law says, this is a permitted use subject to a dimensional limitation, a physical limitation. Just because that limitation is part of the description of the permitted use does not in and of itself mean that the limitation converts our request into a use variance or makes it subject to uh, a different treatment by this board or by the planning board. It is similar to any other use that's permitted uh, that, uh, uh, in other districts that have similar or, or other types of dimensional limitations. There was a uh, part of the materials that were submitted to us was an interpretation of the ordinance by the town, correct? The code correct. enforcement officer? Right. And I believe the code enforcement officer's interpretation was that the application that before us tonight is an area variance or that's the upshot of the interpretation, correct? Well, I read it to be not only that, but that this was a permitted use in an R1 district. Right. And that this application would be an area variance, Correct. not Correct. a use variance. Correct. All right. And uh, that decision was issued when? I believe that was by letter, March 16th, 2023. I only received a copy of it recently. And I believe it was a letter by the town to the Mallards Landing Homeowners Association in response to an inquiry that they had made. All right. And can someone refresh my recollection as to timing of appeals to contest that interpretation? To appeal the code enforcement's letter? Yes. If, if the code enforcement determined, officer determined that it was a permitted use and that the application in front of us tonight would be an area variance, not a use variance, my understanding is that there's a um, period, time period that any person who's agree or organization that's aggrieved by that decision and disagrees with it has to refute and contest that interpretation. And my I'm, my memory's failing me as to what that time period is. And I believe it says it in the letter, and I don't have that right in front of me. All it says is that it, agreed by the zoning inter interpretation, may have followed appeal to the Zoning Board of Appeals in accordance with 235-101 of the Zoning Code. Mr. Chairman, if I may, typically that quote-unquote statute of limitations period is either 30 or 60 days. Agree. I think in, in either event it's expired if the date of the letter is mid-March. That would be almost four months ago. That's correct, All right. Mr. Chairman. All right. And almost time for an Article 78 would be by. All right. Any other questions or comments from the board? Did you want to continue? I didn't mean to nope. cut you off. Did you? No, Mr. You Chairman, I finished my uh, submission in support of the application. I'm prepared to address any more comments. I would like to reserve some time to address, address, if necessary, any comments made by the public. Oh, we always afford you that. Thank you. All right. um, is there anyone here to speak in favor of this application? Anyone here to speak in opposition to this application? Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, just so you know, um, I have a sign-up sheet that people have called ahead of time. Okay. Um, so the few if you names would, on there. We, at the beginning of the meeting, I indicated we would take those who signed up first. So if you can call the roll of who signed up, and then we'll take them in that order. In addition, I also wanted the board to know I did receive two letters tonight that were given to me and asked if I could read them into the record as well. Okay. Would you like me to do that after public input or now? Uh, after public input. Thank you. So who's first on the list? I'm sorry. Jacob Zoglin? Zoglin. Zoglin. Okay. You knew you were first. I knew, yes. Okay. All right. Good evening, ZBA members, Honorable Chair, 
My name is Jacob Zoglin. I'm an attorney and partner at the Zoglin Group here in Rochester. I don't mean to interrupt you, but is somebody keeping the time? And I'm here tonight to, do you want me to pause? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. And I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of Mallard's Landing Homeowners Association in opposition to UPREP's variance application. First of all, it's my understanding from the school and the town statements that UPREP's project cannot proceed if the variance is denied. And so the impacts of the entire project are relevant. The requested variance would also allow the school and the associated commercial use to be 20 feet closer to the property line. Upon studying the project, it's clear that UPREP has not met its burden as the applicant. And so its application should be denied because any minor benefit uh, to the property owner is outweighed by the detriment to the health, safety, and welfare of the community. Now, as to the first uh, variance factor, the application will produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood uh, and a detriment to nearby properties. And there are a lot of reasons why that's so. Um, first, it will introduce a new school use to the neighborhood, as well as a new commercial catering use, will expand any prior uses, and will increase the intensity of uses overall. Uh, over, it, over the existing conditions at the property, which right now is not being used. Uh, second, development patterns in this neighborhood have trended increasingly residential over many years. And this project would be inconsistent with the residential development pattern by establishing an incompatible school use and commercial catering use. And we can actually look at, the historic, at a historical review of this property, and it confirms uh, what I've just said, and shows that any prior commercial use declined significantly over the last 20 years, even further accelerated over the last 10, and more significantly since 2019. And in 2022, if not earlier, the structure was vacant, put up for sale, and so the property is no longer being put to an active commercial use, let alone any use. Uh, historical satellite imagery shows this with a practically empty parking lot from 2020 through 2023, and I supplemented my materials with uh, the 2023 satellite imagery as well. Um, and I can provide those to the board if they're not before you. I think we did receive those, okay. yes. Uh, third, granting the variance and allowing the project to proceed would create non-conforming conditions that the zoning code specifically seeks to curb. Uh, it would allow development that's inconsistent with the town's comprehensive plan, uh, which does not anticipate citing school uses or commercial uses in R1 districts particularly whereas here it would disrupt a residential neighborhood. This comprehensive plan drives the point home by noting that even higher density residential uses should not be cited near less intensive residential uses um, and should instead be located where there are existing commercial uses, uh, centers, and public transportation, neither of which is the case here. Um, so in addition, uh, the HOA has provided the ZBA with at least two letters from real estate professionals that give expert opinions as to how this project will both cause an undesirable change in the community and a detriment to property values and the nearby properties as a result. In support of its application, the school asserts that there are three prior variance applications uh, that are similar to this application that uh, may have been approved by the ZBA, but that's just not true. The matters cited by the school are not appropriate comparison points and are factually different from this matter. Because, for example, those applications involved single family residential uses, uh, whereas this application involves a school use with uh, a culinary program. Additionally, none of the other applications cited involved significant opposition, but UPREP's application um, involves significant opposition that's based on firsthand knowledge and professional opinions. Well, let me just clarify one point. I think you'll agree with me that if the level of opposition was the determinative factor, we wouldn't need a zoning board of appeals. We'd just have the residents vote, right? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm, the point I was making is not the quantity of the opposition, but that the fact that there is firsthand knowledge, which is a factual okay. issue, as well as um, uncontroverted expert opinions in the form of letters from real estate professionals. Okay. Um, Moreover, each of the three um, matters referenced by the applicant involved much smaller parcels and requested significantly less relief than uh, is being requested by this application. So they're factually distinguished. Uh, in a more appropriate comparison what, that would be more apt would be to look at the four uh, applications that the ZBA denied for area variances, which we included in our letter. 
Um, I'm going to skip around a little bit and not address the second factor unless there's time. I'm going to move to the third factor. Um, as well, the another question that isn't goes doesn't go against your time. Can you pinpoint for us in an email or a note the cases that you're relying on that we denied? Because I went through the minutes and I had a hard time figuring out which specific ones you were talking about. I don't want to take your time because there's lots of other people, but if you can just get that to us, give them another minute. I believe it was in the letter, but I will I'll okay. double check and make sure. Um, as to the third factor, the application should be denied because the variance is substantial. It would allow the 50 foot required setback to be reduced by uh, over 20 feet, which is more than 40%, um, which is substantial by any metric. Uh, it's also obviously substantial because it would al allow the property to be converted from a vacant former commercial use to a, uh, a bustling school use that has a uh, commercial component with its catering program that offers things for sale. That would also be more intensive than the current use of the property, which is really relevant here. There's really, therefore, no merit to the school's argument that this change in use will not result in more substantial use uh, or more intensive use of the property. Uh, additionally, my letter cites three cases from appellate courts in New York State that determined that much smaller variances than what are sought here were substantial. Um, finally, it's worth noting uh, not that the Greece decision is binding, but just it's relevant to, to see that in a, you know, adjacent jurisdiction, uh, a slightly smaller yet still substantial charter school application was denied in 2019, even in a busier district. Um, as to the fourth factor, there, can I have a little bit more time because I did answer a couple questions? I gave you another minute. I had two questions. Up to you here. I'll give you 30 seconds. Thank you. Uh, as to the fourth factor, the requested variance will have an adverse impact on physical and environmental conditions, including through impacts on traffic, noise, fumes, trees, and the environment. Um, it's my understanding that there was a traffic uh, study submitted, but that it was insufficient and that they were required to, uh, are required to supplement it, that they want in input from uh, DOT and uh, a discussion of how it would be affected if there were a school zone. There's also at least 20 mature trees that would have to be cut down, if not more, which will reduce the buffer between the high intensity uses and the low intensity residential uses. Are those 20 trees located in the area that we're talking about, the 29.6 feet? Uh, no, not all okay. of them, um, but it, it's relevant because the use is gonna be expanded and that'll be applied to the entire thing. All right. Um, so in I've given you another minute, another 30 seconds. Just, uh, you know, in conclusion. And, I, and we received your 104-page submission, so. Thank you, uh, Chair and ZBA members. Right. Um, would you like me to respond to the comments about the uh, request for interpretation that was addressed to my clients? Well, I would have thought that that would have been something that you might have done during your time, but there's... I'm counting here roughly 40 other people at five minutes a person would be another 200 minutes, which would be another three plus hours, and it's 8.30 now. Understood, Mr. Chairman. And, um, and I suspect that we'll be back and you'll have another opportunity in the future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, honorable board members. I hope you have a good evening. Thank you for hearing me out. Today. You also. Thank you. All right. Next on the list. Uh, Maria Mashira, 85 Baycrest Drive. Thank you. Uh, Maria Mashira, 85 Baycrest Drive. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm here in opposition to approving said area variance. Um, before I wrote this, I sort of didn't know um, the explanation, but I... Um, understand it now since the beginning of your meeting, how you explained it to me. Um, so I'm uh, here in opposition to approving said area variance to maintain an existing building with less than required setback from an adjoining lot line on premises 3000 East Ridge Road in our residential one district. Thank you for listening to our concerns this evening. My mother, Anna Willie, has lived in her home for the last 50 years of her 81 years. I was raised there for 25 years and returned there to live with my mom for the last five years. First off, we need clarification to the area variance that University Prep for young men are seeking, which you guys already did that for me, so thank you. Um, 
Number two, in the Zoning Board of Appeals, if the Zoning Board of Appeals approves the said variance, will this keep going on for the next five years, coming back to other variance requests? This, this board needs to know that by changing 3000 East Ridge Road to an R1 residential district, it has caused so much heartache and anguish to myself and other neighbors on Baycrest Drive and surrounding neighborhoods. Baycrest Drive does not, and from what I was told, cannot have sidewalks added to our street and valley circle, which will change the character of our neighborhood if more traffic comes through dead end streets. Number three, will the town approve a higher fence for our backyard fencing issues facing the 3000 East Ridge Road building? A six foot fence won't even touch hiding a huge gym behind our houses. If the dimensions are anything like the one built on Ladder Road in Greece in the Old Mother Sorrow School, then I think it definitely will change the character of our neighborhood. Who would even buy our house if my mother decides to sell her home? My mom and I feel that exception, exceptions are being met to accommodate a school which will be bringing in much more traffic, residents, noise, and pollution, which we feel changes the character of our neighborhood. We hope everyone on this board thinks about this request from Harris Beach, uh, PLLC, acting agent for University Charter School for Young Men, long and hard. Come see our backyards and where their property line will be encroaching on ours if this area variance is approved. Thank you for, list, for giving me the time to discuss our concerns with the Town of Arundaquit Zoning Board of Appeals. You were referring to Mother of Sorrows School in Greece? The, the, the former, yeah. There's the, um, they built a beautiful addition um, gym. It's huge. I'm just trying to find on the thing where that would be. Um, it's right. Um, there's. Um, Flat and Mount Reed? Yes, correct. In that area? Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm not familiar with that. That's yeah, was it was just built maybe five years ago. Okay. Um, sort of sunken into the ground, but beautiful um, thing, and okay. that's all I my concerns with. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Next, I have Diane Hamilton at 161 Bay, Bay Crest Drive. Can you come up to the microphone, please? Diane Hamilton, 161 Baycrest Drive. My comments tonight, sir, were regarding um, all the traffic that we're going to have, the buses. And since we're only talking about the setback and the variance, I guess my comments are not able to be um, spoken to, um, tonight. Well. The, the question is whether they relate to that. They what's do not in front relate. They relate to the busing and how um, all the bus. This is what I have to say, and it's not even five minutes. I live okay. at Diane Hamilton. I live at 161 Baycrest Drive for 46 years. We've lived there. We raised our family at this address and have always loved the quiet neighborhood. There's very little traffic. There are always people walking, jogging, biking, pushing baby strollers, kids on skateboards, scooters at any given time during the day. There has never been an issue regarding traffic with any previous businesses at 3000 Eastridge Road. Unfortunately, the proposed location of UPREP will change all that. As stated on the town zoning board of appeals tab, five factors must be considered when deciding to grant an area of variance. And the first is, and I quote, possible change in the neighborhood character. Character Will the granting of the variance result in an undesirable change of the character of the neighborhood, or will it be detrimental to the proper, nearby properties? With transportation for 500 plus students, 85 staff members, 13 buses, and who knows how many private vehicles entering and leaving the property twice daily for, 12 mo for 10 months, it will definitely result in an undesirable change to the neighborhood character. Costage Engineering's May 16th response to the planning board sketch plan comments. They've listed a schedule of staggering drop off and pick up buffs of bus times, which, quote, will result in a very minimal queuing on site. Nowhere is it listed how many students will be coming to and from school by private vehicles. 
The morning bus schedule starts at 8.15 and ends at 9.06. Listed are 13 morning buses arriving at one and five minute increments. Four of the morning buses show only one student. How do the other 500 plus students get to the school? They can't all arrive on the other nine buses. They have to come by private vehicles. For the afternoon bus schedule, pickup starts at 8 at 3.30 and ends at 4.45. Five buses are listed at the same time, 4 p.m. Again, there are 13 buses and the schedule only shows five students on four of the buses. How do the other 500 plus students get home? Not on the other nine buses, but by private vehicles. The morning bus schedule runs for 45 minutes. The afternoon bus schedule runs for an hour and 15 minutes. That means residents could be held hostage in their home during these peak time periods. Again, this is the schedule is for buses only. Nowhere is there a schedule for parent drop-off, pickup, or for the 85 staff members entering and leaving the property daily. As we all know, schedules look great on paper, but one little gitch throws the schedule completely off. Eastridge Road and all surrounding roads are only two lanes with no shoulder. Where would the buses and private vehicles go when waiting to get into the parking lot? Diesel buses idling on Ridge Road, cars backed up or circling on Side Street is not an option. This amount of daily traffic will substantially increase traffic above present levels and, quote, result in an undesirable change to the character of the neighborhood. In the end, the developer, engineer, and real estate people, they get paid. They walk away. They don't think twice about how they've impacted our quiet neighborhood where people have lived and where people have put their heart and souls into their homes. Would you want noisy diesel buses idling and excess of vehicles entering and leaving your quiet neighborhood twice daily? I think not. Listen to the residents and deny any variances for this property. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your... Thank you. Uh, there's none of that. Comments are directed to the board, not to the applicant. If you cannot keep your thoughts to yourself, you're free to leave. But we're conducting this in a proper way. I'm sorry, what's that, ma'am? Oh, yes, you can shake your hands like that if, you, if you'd like to, but no applause, please. Or booing or any other comments. Next on the list. Helene Schneur. 87 Bainol Drive Road. Excuse me, Bainol Road. Um, my name is Helene Sneeher. I live at 87 Bainol Road. Um, just like the previous speakers, I misunderstood the specific uh, variance, area variance request. I did not know the difference between area variances and use variances. Um, I will note that very many of the points that were made by Mrs. Hamilton, I was planning on discussing in my pre four minute presentation, which I won't do now, about the traffic safety issues as it, as it affects really several hundred households in that area. Because Newport Road, you have Baycrest, you have um, Bainol Road, you have, um, was it, uh, mooring landing, you have Newport Road, one point of egress for all of those something like 80 households, and that's 200 feet from where the entrance is for, um, for the property in question. Then you have all of the other households and the um, apartment complex south of Eastridge Road. But um, what I want to ask now is if it's possible to ask questions. So my objections were more as to the use variance. So I want to ask who decides the use variance and has that use variance um, been approved already? There was some talk about that um, the use of the building as, the school, as a school is allowed, but I would like more information. My, my understanding is that the town code enforcement officer was asked to make a determination as to whether or not the use was a permitted use in an R1 district, and that the code enforcement officer um, received information from what I read from the state education department and concluded that it was a permitted use, and that that determination was made sometime in March, okay. and an appeal could have been taken to this board to determine whether or not 
that interpretation was a correct interpretation of the board, but no appeal was, nothing was presented to us to rule on that issue, so. So that's something that's passed already. Um, okay, um, I had a problem with Mr. Pavi saying that they're not planning, even though this has nothing to do with that one, that, with that setback, um, they do not plan on extending the footprint. Um, according to the planning board minutes, uh, planning board agenda from last month's planning board meeting, uh, Nichols Construction was um, asking for the redevelopment of an existing building to include a new 15,438 plus square foot building addition and a non-regulation size track and field. To me, if you're including a new 15,000 square foot building, that is an extension of the footprint. So um, I don't see that as how that can, I, to me, this whole project has to be looked at in its entirety, not just one sign or the corner of one building. And also, um, I'm asking about the setbacks that Mr. Pavi referred to as a 50-foot setback for um, private schools, but a 29-foot setback for... Um, no, the ordinance requires a 50-foot setback for a school. And they're asking for a 29.6-foot setback instead of 50 feet. That's the application that's in front of us. Okay. And that's the, what, you're, what is confusing is what is within the purview of a zoning board, what is within the purview of a planning board, what is within the purview of a town board, what is within the purview of a conservation board, and all the other boards. We have a very limited uh, okay. portion of the whole project. Okay. All right. Okay, um, thank you very much for your time. You're very welcome. Next, I have Karen Miller, 131 Valley Circle. Good evening, Karen Miller, 131 Valley Circle. I presented to you or submitted to you, and you should have received um, a comparison to the Greece decision in 2019. Yes. And while that may not be um, appropriate for this variance, there is a section within that that they cited. And one of the reasons for the decline was proximity to nearby residents. This will bring the structure 30 feet closer to the adjoining residential district. A dumpster enclosure is proposed to be 80 feet from adjoining residential area and have approximately uh, a one acre playing field is proposed within the uh, 60 feet. Space for outdoor activities. Typically, the noisiest aspect of a school will be located within 50 feet of a property line. We you, have you talking in relation to this project this, or is no, that this Greece? Was Greece? That was Greece. This was okay. Greece. All right. And they denied it because it was 30 feet. Okay. 30 feet closer to residents. So, you know, as a president, they have had the courage to deny it. And we're asking you for the same courtesy. I would also like to echo um, under oath, their representatives said there would be no increase in footprint, and yet the planning board has received plans for a, a gymnasium, a two-story gymnasium. So what else can we not trust coming from their attorneys? Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Chair, board, that's all I have that is signed up to speak on my list. All right, list. so everyone who signed up has spoken. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Form a line to the side there and come up in the order that you're in line. 
State your name and address. Good, e <clears throat> Good evening. My name is William Farrell. I'm the president of the Mallard's Landing Homeowners Association. I'd like to speak to the point that you just raised about the appeal to the zoning board about the use variance. Yes. I did submit an appeal to the zoning board in February and um, submitted it to the Planning and Zoning Division. They held on to it because at that point the decision had been publicly announced by the uh, Planning and Zoning Division that the use, had already, use variance had already been granted. They took the appeal and then contacted me and said it doesn't have to be appealed now and they've held on to it pending, uh, apparently that was the time when they were contacting the Charter Schools Institute to find the exemption that was located for this school's particular charter. So I did in fact file an appeal of that decision and was uh, I actually have never heard anything since about that appeal. That was filed before the March, uh, whatever the letter, letter was, 18th or 21st. Yeah, so I think if I, and Michelle, correct me if I'm wrong, I think what, what happened was there was an appeal of, of essentially no, no decision. So well, there no, wasn't that, really that, anything that, to the very, appeal. The very first meeting in January, the chair of the planning and zoning board, or the planning board, made an announcement before the workshop began that the Planning and Zoning Division had already informed them that this was a permitted use. Subsequent to that, I appealed that. I asked for documentation of that over a two-month period and never received anything from the Planning and Zoning staff. Then I was told I should file an appeal with the Zoning Board, which I did, and that was tabled. I never heard any more on it until I was called and said, we're not going to forward it. Apparently, that was during the period of time when they were trying to find some evidence to make their earlier decision Correct. Was there a reason you didn't appeal the formal interpretation? Well, when I read it, I know that I know enough about the the uh, exemption that was granted to this school. It was deemed to be a private school for the purposes of zoning. However, the letter itself was inherently inconsistent. It said they were exempt from zoning, but were required to comply with the 50-foot setback zoning code. Yeah, so, so, I, so I said, yeah, exempt what do I from, do with that? I, I, exempt from, from local zoning? Says, I think they said that it, it has to comply with all, all local zoning. It, the letter and said it, that check because it they were deemed to be a private school for the purposes of local zoning, the use was permitted. However, they weren't exempt from the 50-foot setback rule, which is a zoning rule. Right, so, so they need relief from that, correct. Well, what I was saying is that that's an inconsistent outcome from that letter. On the one hand, they're saying they're exempt, and then the next statement says that they are not exempt. No, so I and think I didn't know what the status of my appeal was, and nothing. I have never heard anything since then. Yeah, so I think, and, and feel free, Town, to correct. I think what happened was there was an appeal of essentially no, no, no there was no it was, formal it was decision. It was publicly stated at the uh, planning yeah. planning board workshop in January that the use is a permitted use. Oh, oh, a planning. So a planning board workshop is not a. Oh no, this was at the public. This was at. Uh, it was at the um, workshop. Right. So there's so the chair of the planning uh, planning board stated publicly before the uh, workshop even began that he had been informed by the planning and zoning uh, staff that this was a permitted use in an R1 district. And at the time, they said it was because it was a private school, which I pointed out it's not a private school. It's a public school. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, we will can dive into the timeline. I mean, it's... Well, all I'm saying is I, I would never there, heard, there was I ample never was, I never had a formal response to the appeal, and it was stated that why so, didn't I appeal? Yeah, and I, I guess, did appeal in time of the earlier, apparently, uh, premature decision of the Planning and Zoning Division. Yeah, so I guess when I'm looking at what was sent to the town... Uh, persons aggrieved by zoning interpretation may file an appeal. Um, and I was advised by the Planning and Zoning Division to file the appeal with the Zoning Board. And, and it didn't happen after you received? I got a call saying we're not going to forward it to the Zoning Board, and nothing more was said to me until I got that letter. I assumed my appeal was still standing. Okay. I guess we'll have to... Well, I'm merely just addressing the point that was made that why didn't we appeal? We right. did appeal. Yeah. Did, not, not, that, not that decision, though. Not the March letter. Because that, that wasn't no, in existence no, at no, that, that time. So existence. you can't just say we appeal anything that comes in the no, future. No, I said yeah. in my appeal that we were appealing the decision of the... But you didn't know what the decision was. The decision had been stated publicly at the planning workshop that the, uh, per, the use was permitted. <laughs> That's not a formal interpretation. It's a bit more nuanced, but we can right. say we, this. We can look into that, and we'll. But 
you had other comments that you wanted to make. No, I wanted to address that point. Okay. Um, All right. be quick. Um, good evening. My name is Jessica Schaefer. I live at 105 Baycrest Drive, and I want to say that I oppose this area variance. If this building is going to be used as a school, they should have to follow the code for the school, which is a 50-foot setback. We shouldn't have to bear the brunt of the use and allow a variance that will surely impact the abutting properties with elevated noise levels and view of school activity. In my opinion, this code should also be reevaluated as I don't think 50 feet from a school is enough and I'm one of the properties that is going to be inside my house 90 feet from a gymnasium. So if the school wants the building, they should have to follow the code and reconstruct the southernmost portion of the building at their own expense, not ours. And there is a clear difference in our neighborhood on the impact it would be between dozens of software engineers writing code and 600 people in a building. Thank you. My name is Anthony McLean. I live at 2716 East Ridge Road. I'm going to read this first part just because I think it needs to be in the record at every meeting. According to New York Consolidated Law, Education Law, EDN 2862, the applicant, in this case, UPREP, shall provide an analysis of the community support for such relocation of the projected programmatic and fiscal impact of the charter school in the proposed new school district and on other public and non-public schools in the same area. There has been no outreach by the applicant to gather or collect or analyze community support. You know, I'm not a lawyer, but that sounds to be uh, Non-compliant to me. I'm not familiar with that section. Does it section what's 7B. 7B of what? The education law? EDN 2862. Hold on. E-E-N? E, -E -N? e Edward David Noel. And you said it was what section? 2862. 2862. Okay. Does it say who that analysis is to be submitted to? Uh, well, I extracted this quote from a much larger document. Okay. I, I said right. it wasn't a lawyer, but this seemed really clear. Okay. I, and, and I want to look it up. That's okay. all. All right. So that's, I'm, I'm just all looking right. for reference so I can figure out what it is you're referring to so I can read it. And secondly, in that reference, the idea is that they must quantify the money being spent in this regard. Someone needs, at this, this process that went through the four or five or six or seven or eight boards, no one has asked what will this cost the city of Irondequoit or the Irondequoit School District. All right. Um, much of what I said has been said, except I am an expert in one thing. I'm an expert in audio. I'm an international expert in audio. It allowed me a nice retirement in Rochester. And what I know is it's going to be too loud there and that UPREP has provided no support in their sound document to indicate otherwise. Their sound document is a collection of little clips and snippets from various ac academic texts and that sort of thing, but it doesn't mention anything on the 3000 East Ridge Road site that will be the noise caused by what goes on there if UPREP is allowed to operate at that location. And that means the 13 school buses, the dumpster slamming all day, the HVAC that's at ear level to the people on the next drive, the football practice field where they use the most flowery language all the time, and they're 11 feet from the property of the people next door. 
there is a lot of noise going into this. I have the documentation that I created with modeling software, but you wouldn't accept that because I'm an interested party. In the last week, however, I have searched four other experts that it will cost us five to ten grand to produce a document in this regard, but we'll do it if we have to. But what I'm asking is that you do it, that you ask, you prep to produce a scientific document that employs a technique called noise mapping. And noise mapping atta attaches a sound value, an intensity value to all activity. So the uh, 120 can, cars that come in today. Can, can you submit the information about noise mapping to the zoning and planning office so they can disseminate it to the members of the well, board? Well, we've, we've brought this up before, and that's when we got the costage clippings out of some antiquated So this things. was, you've already presented this to the planning board? I, I've mentioned it. Directly, yes. Okay. And, and what right. we got was so weak, it uh, you know wouldn't fly across the room. Well, did you do the noise mapping thing to the? I did myself. Yeah. No, no. no. Did did you present that to the planning board? Uh, yeah, two or three times ago. But it okay. was me. All right. You know, and so somebody's going to go. Well, you're an interested party. We're not interested. We want. We all we want is someone who is a non-biased party to do this sound and noise mapping in a professional way, and we will abide by their decision. And I'm confident you will find that, that decision is nowhere close to what it should be in this quiet neighborhood. And finally, uh, one of my colleagues tonight presented some information about home values and a decrease in home values. Well. Uh, if you have a 20 dp or db increase in sound over a period of time in a residential neighborhood you will lose 10 percent of your property value it sounds like they were already going to lose 10 percent of their property value before because there was a school there now we've got a school and an urban parking lot sir plopped down. sir you're way past the five minutes All right. okay and in fairness to everybody else, there's still at least... I, I got, I'm fine with that. Right. I, I just want someone to actually act on this. Thank you, sir. Next. I'm Nancy McLean. I live at 2716 East Ridge Road. What I want to do right now for you is to walk off the distance here. So the distance of the variance is 20.4 feet? Correct. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. 16. So I didn't even get 20 feet. And what is that 20 foot Variance. Oh, what each each of the tiles in the ceiling is two feet. And oh, I was doing it like this. Right. Well, I'm. This is one foot between my. I'm I'm doing it by. There's thirty two. So you're doing. So you're not feet. doing four. So my point is, twenty point four feet. Correct. This is the variance, and what is that footage going to change in the neighborhood? that it's landing. And it's going to change the neighborhood in a huge way. You've driven all these other places. You get around. You went to all these other I went there places. as well. It's very different. When it people is. think of East Ridge Road, they think of past 590. They don't think of the other side of 590. Right. And so. I just think a variance of 20 feet and the difference it would make in the entire neighborhood is way bigger than 20.4 feet. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. My name is Bobby Porter, Six Bay Crest Drive. I retired four years ago from Rochester City School District for 34 years. And I've been to a couple schools, and I know how big the parking lots, how everything is big. My question is, like the variance, where 
they said last time that they're not going to use that under thing by the front door for the buses. They're going to go way back and line them up, which is close to the houses. Also, with the noise, when I went to visit the school way back, I asked, you know, and I knew a lot of people because city school, they worked there. And she, I asked if they'd fight. Oh, no, we just push and shove. Well, like a month and a half, maybe two months ago, through the grapevine for the schools, that kids were fighting, a lot of, like 20 of them. Cops came. Parents came. The parents are fighting. We don't need that in the neighborhood. And boys will be boys. You know, they get mad the mouth, you know, I'm just saying, we don't need it in the neighborhood. I don't care if they're black, white, purple, green, yellow. I don't care about color. I'm thinking of the kids, that how big room enough for them to maneuver around. And if it gets tight, I mean, where they were, it was way tight, I understand. But here, it's a little bit bigger, but it's all about the kids. And if you don't have room for the kids and the buses and all this. What are you doing? You, you're not helping the kids. Thank you. Thank you. Dave Nicoletti, 45 Baker's Drive. Speaking of just the corner of the building, you must consider safety and also liability of the neighbor neighbors, the HOA, who will be responsible if someone gets hurt on their property. Talk about traffic, talk about parking. There will be overflow parking. They've already talked about looking for an overflow, overflow parking uh, area. Um, my comments I had made to the planning board, um, <clears throat> they're looking for off-site off parking. Well, it's naive to think that some of this is during activities. They're going to have football games, they're going to have basketball games, not football games, but they're going to have practices. They might have scrimmages with our schools. And they've already admitted that they're, they are going to probably need off-site parking. So it's naive to think that someone's going to show up to the building, find a full parking lot, drive to some remote location to get shuttled in. They're going to drive around Baycrest, park on Valley Circle, and walk around that corner of the building on their property. So please consider that. The liability, they're on a private road to begin with that the HOA has to deal with. Just take that in consideration. The safety and liability, because that corner is too close to the property line. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, Joe Salasetti, uh, 349 Sandora Circle. Um, I realize this is about the setback issue, but if you were to uh, grant that uh, ease, uh, variance, I think that we would all agree in my neighborhood that, you know, everybody said it before about the traffic, the buses coming in from all, all areas, from Norton Street, down Bayview, up Bayshore, from Ridge Road, uh, 590. I mean, there's going to be a lot of traffic on top of it. And it's, it's you know, tax taxpayers would lose. There's no taxes will be paid uh, going forward. Walkers and joggers and bicyclists, commuters, traffic jams and road travel. Um, first responders would lose. They don't have access, a good access to the uh, buildings as they were, as reported by the uh, fire department. Um, and also I would like to, there was an article in the paper last week about a charter school that closed, just closed uh, in the city because uh, the Board of Regents denied them. They weren't, uh, weren't Weren't, weren't working up to uh, what they uh, really expected, so they shut them down, and uh, they voted unanimously in April not to renew the Urban Choices Charter, a step that usually ends the discussion.
but the school sued, arguing the state's determination process had been flawed and asked, asking a state Supreme Court judge in Albany County to stop the closure. Um, the intervention would have needed to come by June 30th when the school's charter expired. It did not, and so on July 1st, Urban Choice formally lost its charter and had to admit defeat. Uh, they are looking for, in coming days and weeks, we will work with each family to ensure we provide as much information as possible to receiving schools in support of successful transitions. I just question, you know, what happens if this goes through and this charter school gets, gets built and gets, you know, set up, and they also get denied. They get closed down by the Board of Regents. Uh, we got a building and all of this, all the, all the money put into this it would not be, you know, usable anymore. Uh, that's pretty much it. I just Thank you, sir. Hi, my name is Sharon Zerman. I live at 106 Baycrest Drive. I typically don't speak at these things, um, but I just have a couple of words to say. Um, I'm just going to echo what Jessica said here, which is, seems very clear to me that schools need 50 feet, and we don't, they're going to be less than, they're going to be more than 50 feet, or less than 50 feet, whatever. Um, so I just feel like that's written there. Like, that's why are we even talking about this? Like, this is what's stated, the ordinance or the variance or whatever. Um, to me, it's a no-brainer. So thank you. Hello. Sean Johnson, 130 Bay Knoll Road. First time caller, long time listener. <laughs> Not really that long, sorry. Just recently. Uh, I have questions really about, uh, I guess, uh, so the, the use variance decision versus the area variance decision. Um, I was looking up a document and it says that if you're a third party or nearby resident, you may still file an appeal more than 60 days after the permit is filed if you file within 30 days after you've had a reasonable opportunity to find out about the planned project. I'm just finding out about this decision as a resident on Bay Knoll right around the corner. I mean, I feel like that's close enough to be a third party resident. I understand people on, uh, some people got letters in, what is it, Mallard's Landing with that decision on the area variance, but nobody else did. Like, I, I never received anything about that. Um, so I'm just learning about that. So if I'm interpreting that correctly, that seems like we should be able to still appeal that decision that it was an area variance versus a use variance. I also just want to make the point that we've talked about how this is an area variance. However, use and area are not mutually exclusive here because the area is dependent on the use. The 50 feet is dependent on it being a school, right? And so the use does matter because if it wasn't a school, it wouldn't be 50 feet. So you can say it's an area variance, but it is also that area is dependent on the use of the building. And so they are not mutually exclusive. We can't simply write off the fact that it's a school just because we said it's an area variance. Well, that area is dependent on the fact that it's a school. I also just want to comment, since I have the time and I've never done this before, everyone's listening to me, it's kind of nice. <laughs> I just have to comment on a couple of comments that I heard that I thought, found very shocking to hear that a engineering firm cannot reconstruct a corner of a building without moving an entire building. Seems a little asinine, if I have to say so myself. Um, there's plenty of solutions beyond moving the entire building instead of reconstructing one corner. The whole building is not dependent on one corner of the building. I would highly debate that and look for other solutions if that was the route they were just choosing to go. Is that my five minutes? No. That's not no. my time? It's somebody else's phone, I think. Okay. Um, I think that was about it. So I just wanted to bring up those points. I wanted the residents to hear that we may still have that opportunity to appeal that decision. I don't know if you have any advice for us or a response to that. As a, like I said, I'm looking that up on a New York State document about if you find out about it after the 60 days, you could still appeal that decision. Are the you only, familiar? The only advice I'd have for you is look into it if that's what you want to do and pursue whatever you may have available to you. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I 
was up before talking about the appeal. Could I just make a couple comments? Um, Generally, we don't allow repeat. Particularly, how many more people want to address the board tonight? Please raise your hands. All right. Seeing none. All right. So in we'll make an uh, exception. William Farrell, um, again, president of the Mallards Landing Homeowners Association. Um, in preparing for this hearing, I studied previous zoning board hearings on the Irondequoit television channel, mm -hmm. and I heard you, Mr. Hinman, talk specifically about town policy, specifically in two cases involving vape shops. One was in uh, Irondequoit Plaza, another one was on Eastridge Road in that plaza. And those cases involve, uh, one was a fairly substantial difference, I think, in the 1,000-foot setback. One, I think, was somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe 100 feet versus uh, uh, 100 feet uh, that they didn't comply. But you made the point that it's town policy and you wanted to abide by town policy and you had no reason to challenge that. And in one of those cases, I think the town policy had been made after the company involved had already obtained a lease and was planning to open it and had been given advice by the town itself that they could go ahead. And notwithstanding that, you made the decision that they not to approve those variances. And I believe those were area variances as well. If you can, this is town if, policy. If you can, if you can point out to us what those decisions were, I'll gladly go back and look at. Well, what they you're were talking both turned about. down. They were both turned down. I no, mean, but you, if you can tell us when, tell me at least when it was. I'll look and well, one see was, what it was. One I think was in uh, February of 2022. Okay. And um, one that, that's the one I think that involved uh, Rondequay Plaza. And oh, the Irondequoit was, Plaza one, yeah. Right, and okay. then there was one in Eastridge on the plaza there, and that was a similar thing. It was a vape shop that they wanted to build, and it violated the 1,000-foot setback. Right, the I'm point not. I'm trying to make is that you made the point in both of those hearings that it was town policy to set the 1,000-foot rule. It's also town policy for the 50-foot rule for schools. And you made it clear to the applicants in those two cases that there was no reason for you to grant any substantial variance to that because it was town policy for it to be so. I don't see any reason why that wouldn't be the case here. This is town policy that for schools there must be a 50-foot setback, not a 49-foot or a 30-foot or a 20-foot. It's 50 feet. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else? Is there anyone who wants to speak to this application that's neither for it nor against it? Oh, and you're going to read the letters that were submitted. Thank you. First one I have is from Kevin Tidings, 339 Sandor Circle. I think the question is, what is the purpose of town codes? If it is to protect the integrity and quality of life for residents, then this is a perfect example of a time when the town code should be upheld. I understand the need for variance because there are always exceptions, but this is an example of a situation where the zoning board has a responsibility to interpret the town zoning code and see the in implications of not following a town code and the impact this will have on the community. We have heard through this process that this is coming down from the state level, but this is a situation you have control over. This is the perfect time to show the importance of local government doing what is right for the community we all live in and serve. Next one is uh, received from Jennifer Nicoletti, 45 Big Crest Drive. You pre proposed school re relocation to 3000 Eastridge Road. Dear Mr. Hinman and members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, let me start by telling you that my roots run very deep in Irondequoit. I am a lof lifelong resident of East Irondequoit, aside from nine years in West Irondequoit, and proud alumni of Eastridge High School Class of 1986. I am also a small business owner on Eastridge Road. We have enjoyed peace and tranquility in our current home at 45 Baycrest Drive for 22 years. We understood when we moved here that there was an office building behind our property at 3000 East Ridge Road, but it never bothered us as it was just that, a quiet office building. We often did not even know they were there. My father, Russ Thomas, served on the Zoning Board of Appeals for almost 15 years until he passed away four years ago. He always said that the first consideration and most important is how do the neighbors feel about the proposed change because they are the ones who are going to have to live with it day in and day out. I know you have read and heard about the big issues. Allowing this relocation would take this commercial building off the tax rolls, further burdening all town residents, residents to make up that difference. 
There will be significant traffic issues driving up and down Baycrest that has no sidewalks and other surrounding side streets and parking issues on these side streets as well. I'm sharing our additional concerns about the character of the neighborhood, which is just as important. This proposed relocation will not just alter it, it will destroy it and our ability to have a quiet environment enjoyment of our property. Installing a track and field will require clear cutting all the mature trees in the field and cramming this on top of us. As you are aware, the charter schools are only renewed up to a five years at a time. What happens if their charter is not renewed in five or ten years and they close or they relocate elsewhere? They get to walk around, walk away, and we are left with a situation that cannot be reversed. Charter schools are supposed to provide alternatives to students in underperforming school districts like Rochester Central School District, which is where they obtained their charter. East Rondequoit is an excellent school district and has no need for a charter school. If any students from surrounding school districts want to attend the school, even just one student from their home school district is required to provide transportation. The possibility is very real that there would be many buses, not just like Tan they indicated, to transport students. UPREP told us at a public hearing in January that they looked at 20 properties, but none had green space like this one. They only want green space so they can destroy it to destroy it to cover it with a track and field. Talk about noise. We will be assaulted listening to whistles, screaming and yelling well into the evening. So much for enjoying a nice dinner or any outdoor activities in our yard. Their application states they will be on site until 8 p.m. Our houses at this end are on a hill, so we are elevated over the field. We see clearly over our existing six-foot fence. It only serves to keep deer and people out of our yard. UPREP's application states that they will surround the property with a six-foot vinyl fence. As that property is even lower than our fence, it will do absolutely nothing to block our view of the track field. In fact, we won't even see it as it will be at least three feet lower than our fence. We are on a hill that slopes all the way down to the parking lot out back. And we all know a fence does nothing to address the issue of constant noise that will come from students and coaches using the space. This severely and negatively impacts our quality of life. We are not being given a choice about this and are dependent on you to advocate for us. New York State ED requirements state that a secondary school should be located on 10 acres with an additional acre for every 100 students. I do not understand how this re relocation can, ha allowed to be hap can be allowed to happen. Excuse me. It demonstrates very clearly that this six-acre property and complete redevelopment of the surrounding land to the track field is simply too small. Additionally, what prevents others in the vicinity from using this field on the weekends so the noise will become a seven days a week? The letter you prep submitted with their application states that they now plan to increase their enrollment even more than what they told us at the public hearing in January to 600 students. We were told from 450 currently to 525. Now we read in their cover letter that they want to add another 75 students, which requires even more staff, and they have not even relocated. Historically, this building has had, has only had a maximum of 150 people working here. The proposal from UPREP increases that population fivefold. Approving this variance will likely allow the school to move into this property, which is a huge mistake with detrimental consequences that will negatively impact residents over, for decades to come. I can only hope that the members of the zoning board have the same concern for us, the residents, that my father had when he served on it. The first consideration and the most important is how do the neighbors feel about the proposed change? Because they, they are the ones who are going to live with it day in and day out. Thank you for your time and consideration. I have every confidence that common sense will prevail. Respectfully, Jennifer Thomas Nicoletti. It's quick. Give you 30 seconds. I moved here eight years ago. My husband died, so I wanted a nice, quiet place. I lived cornered Baycrest, Newport. I've got tons of gardens. I get so many compliments. If the school goes in, I'm out. I'm moving. I can't.
All right, thank you. And it's killing me. See, applicant. Oh, well, first, let me. Is there anyone else that? Oh, Hi. okay. Sorry. Valissa Johnson, 130 Bainol Road. Um, I just wanted to say that in observing this process tonight, I noticed that other applicants earlier brought neighbors to support their project. And I know from personal experience that neighbor opposition is often heavenly weighed in granting or denying variances to homeowners. Uh, my father-in-law had to get neighbor's signatures to approve a variance for a shed placement. And I just want to point out that UPREP has not brought in any neighbors to support their proposition. Also, I don't understand why they would need a variance given the New York State Education Department of a 10-acre base. Thank you. Is there anyone else here that wishes to address the board tonight? Mr. Pavia? Mr. Chairman, I'll keep it very brief. I know it's getting late. First, not as late as I thought it would be. <laughs> well, not as late as the planning board meetings go. Uh, first, I'd just like to say none of the trees that run along the southeast corner will be removed as a result of this project. Um, uh, secondly, the variance will not encroach on any of the adjoining properties. Thirdly, um, we are in a residential district, and the corner does not adjoin, uh, the corner adjoins a road, not a residence, which was the case in the town of Greece matter. Otherwise, Your Honor, I think the other comments largely, like I've said before, go to the use that's being proposed, which is properly the issue before the planning board. And those comments that were made about the 20.4 feet setback that we're seeking really were not supported by any specific evidence. So we believe, again, and we respectfully submit that there's a rational and reasonable basis to support the issuance of the area of variance as requested by my client. Yeah. And uh, as you mentioned, we, uh, you wanted time to respond to the submission from well, the, the Zoglin folks? Well, Mr. Chairman, when would we be tabled? When would we be tabled? August. This? August. We meet once a month, the first Monday of the month. Okay. I think we could have a response to that letter made before that August meeting. That would be fine. Also, I'd ask that you address <coughs> the question that I raised at the at the outset as to the 50 foot limitation as opposed to the general uh, setbacks and why it's specific to the school and what the significance of that is in relation to the usual area variances where we're dealing with you know variances from the setbacks understood that apply so to we everyone can, as opposed to a specific one that's geared just to this particular use. I understand, Mr. Chairman. We can have that as part of our response to the Zoglin letter. That would be great. Thank you. Would it, at the risk of being shouted out of the room, uh, we've heard a lot of public because, comments. That won't happen because they, everyone here has performed very well so far, unlike other meetings that we've had, and they <laughs> will continue to do so. We've heard a lot of public comments would it be wrong to suggest that we close the public hearing but allow the public to submit written comments to the board between now and the next meeting? Uh, I'm, since we're going to have responses that deal with the issues that came up, I would prefer to keep the public hearing open. Okay. Uh, those responses, when they're received in the uh, planning and zoning uh, department, would be available for anyone who's interested from the neighborhood, and they may wish to comment on the responses, and so I would... I would rather err on the side of allowing the public to have a full opportunity to express all their concerns than to shut anybody down, Understood. other than the five-minute requirement. I understand, Mr. Chairman. The only thing I would add is to confirm there's never been a use variance application made for this project. There's never been a use variance application entertained by any board of this town. What occurred, as you know, Mr. Chairman, there was an official and formal interpretation made of 235-883 by, by the department, and that is what would be subject to an appeal. Well, and that's another thing that I was trying to find the letter that I saw, thought I saw in the packet of materials that we received, but I can't find it. So can you circulate that uh, opinion letter again? I believe this is the letter. Oh, thank you. 
I'll make sure that everybody on the board gets a copy if they can't find theirs. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, so we are going to uh, suspend the public hearing. And we'll resume August 7th. You're going to leave the public hearing open? Yes. <laughs> okay. We're suspending it. Okay. It, we're not continuing it tonight. We're going to pick it up where we left off on August 7th. Okay. Okay? <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. And we are going to be in recess for 15 minutes.
and probably a little more. So uh, I want to take it, get an idea of who, which applicants are still here. Is anyone still here for 1884 North Goodman Street? No. 46 Westgate Drive. No. 359 Bayfront Lane. No. Nope. 162 Schnackel Drive. No. Nope. 262 Teakwood Drive. 179 Lakefront. 40 Topper Drive. Yes. Okay. All right. You're the first one we'll, we'll deal with then. And I see the applicant and most of the people who were commenting on uh, the last 3,000 East Ridge Road have also left. So the first item on the agenda for which an applicant remains is 40 Topper Drive. This is a, everybody should have received a short environmental assessment form as part of the uh, materials relating to this application. Did everyone receive a copy of the short environmental assessment form and have an opportunity to review that. Uh, I would make a motion that we find that this is a what's the term that I want to use? No, it's not. It's, it, they submitted a short environmental assessment oh, form. Unlisted. It's an unlisted, I guess, that they're saying. Um, What's, what's, the, what's the term that we sign off on that we say negative it's not? Negative declaration. I'll make a, a motion that we uh, make a de negative declaration with respect to uh, this application for purposes of seeker. Second. Any uh, discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion carries, four votes in favor, no opposed, no abstentions, two members. Sir, I'm sorry, I have a question. Yes. Um, it's for a uh, rear setback and a non-conforming fence. I don't know. They submitted a short environmental assessment form. They're RG&E and, &E and, they know, and design, they know what they're doing, so I figured we'll make a negative declaration. Okay, so sometimes it's, it's required within the applications to submit it, but I believe that this should be a type 2 action. Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, please. Yeah, it might, it might fall under the lot line adjustment list in the, uh, basically, I think I'll, most of the area variances fall under that. I don't know if uh, Wes and Kate usually get that the free, the free look, so I don't know if they determined it was unlisted. I think in either event, no significant adverse uh, environmental impacts either way. <laughs> it's the, it's the motion. Oh, okay. Well, finishing up where I left, two members are absent and one is unaccounted for because it doesn't exist. That's all right. No problem. So moving on to the merits of this action, whether it's unlisted or type 2, I'll uh, make a motion that we approve the uh, application as submitted based on the following uh, findings. It won't change the neighborhood character except to improve it by taking what are interesting looking devices that are in public view and putting them indoors. Uh, the area that would, the alternative that would not require a variance would require or could result in 2,300 people, including a major uh, commercial enterprise, not having power for a substantial period of time. It's uh, not a substantial request. Uh, it will have a positive effect on the physical in, or environmental conditions if it's granted. The situation is not self-created. 
because they're required to do this in order to improve the delivery of power to those 2,300 people that they serve through this station and the enhanced need for security now that uh, we're in an age where we have people trying to wreak havoc by uh, destroying power stations and utility uh, sites. I'll second. Right. Any discussion? I'll just say that we don't necessarily approve a for fences because of the security of this, uh, you know, this specific project. It's it's warranted. Oh, I would think that 16 feet is fine, and if they wanted to go 24, I wouldn't have a problem with that either. With lots of stuff at the top to keep people out. All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Four votes in favor, no opposed, no abstentions. Two members of the board are absent and we're short a member of the board. So going back to the top of the agenda for tonight. Uh, first item on the agenda is the application pertaining to 1884 uh, North Goodman Street. This is a type two action for seeker purposes. Does someone wish to make a motion with respect to this application? I'll make a motion that we approve the application as submitted. Uh, I don't think it's going to have a possible change to the character of the neighborhood. It's going to be in the back of the house. Um, there's already a, actually a building there, you know, a sunroom that's already there. They're only adding a few more feet. Uh, after alternatives not requiring a variance, make a smaller bedrooms and everything, which I don't think is appropriate. It's not a substantial request, and I don't think it have any effect on physical and environmental conditions if granted. And it is a self-created uh, situation, but I think it warrants that they probably need the bedroom space and an additional bathroom. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Four votes in favor. Two no Opposed, no abstentions, two members are absent, and one member does not exist. The next application pertains to 46 Westgate Drive. This is a type two action for seeker purposes. With the consent of the uh, applicant, I would move to table this uh, application to the August meeting. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Four votes in favor. No opposed. No abstentions. Two members of the board are absent, and we are short a member of the board. Next uh, application pertains to 359 Bayfront Lane. This is a type two action for seeker purposes. Does anyone wish to make a motion with respect to this application? I'll make a motion that we grant the request by the applicant based on the following findings of fact. Um, character, a neighborhood character, um, he had uh, somebody adjacent to his property come and support. Um, there's a lot of two story decks on the bay and the lake uh, in our community. Alternative solutions, his deck is falling apart, so he's actually improving the property all the way around, and it's just, uh, he's just updating his um, double-decker, um, he's updating his double-decker deck on the top to over, uh, to come over his lower deck. It's not a substantial request, it's only a variance of five feet. 
It's not going to pose any environmental impacts on the uh, community. It is self-created, but he is improving and enhancing his property as well as the uh, property um, within the scope of the, the community. And for that, I request that we grant the area variance. Is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Four votes in favor, two opposed. No, four votes in favor, no opposed, no abstentions. Two members of the board are absent, and we are still short a member. Next uh, application pertains to the property at 162 Schnackel Drive. This is also a type 2 action for seeker purposes. Does anyone wish to make a motion with respect to this matter? I'd like to make a motion that we approve. Uh, possible change to the neighborhood character. He's not really changing anything. There's already a deck there. He's just going to tear it down and rebuild it and only expand it by a little bit. Uh, the alternatives is to just let the deck fall apart. We don't want to see that. Um, it is a substantial request, but like uh, we just previously granted, uh, we want to make sure the decking is safe, especially around that area. Uh, effect on physical and environmental conditions. Again, it's making it safer, so this is an improvement. And is it self-created? Yes, but you want to have a nice, safe desk deck with uh, more modern materials that are easier to keep up. Is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion? I'll just add that the property adjacent looked like when I was there, when I saw you yesterday on my way back up. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I'll just add that the adjacent property seemed like they had done a very similar work uh, with new steps and a new deck, so it would be consistent with the uh, neighbor. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Four votes in favor, no opposed, no abstentions. Two members of the board are absent, and we are lacking a seventh member of the board. Next application is uh, pertaining to 262 Teakwood Drive. This is a Type 2 action for seeker purposes. Does anyone wish to make a motion with respect to I'll make a motion that we grant the variance as requested with the following findings. This will not result in any change to the character of the neighborhood. The deck is located behind the house and is not even going to be visible to any of the adjoining properties except possibly by those passing by at high rates of speed on 104. The alternative that would not require a variance would be very inconvenient uh, because this deck is going to come off of the level of the house that is the most occupied and to use will enable them to get greater use of the backyard that has a rather uh, significant slope uh, down from the house that makes uh, using that aspect of the property not uh, as usable as possible. That's not terrible wording, but uh, you get the drift. It's not a substantial request. There will be no adverse effect on the physical or environmental conditions. It's only self-created to the extent that they want to use their property in, to a greater extent, and that's not sufficient to deny uh, the application. Is there a second? I'll second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Four votes in favor. No opposed. No abstentions. Two members of the board remain absent, and we continue to be uh, short one member of the board. Uh, the next application relating to 179 Lakefront. This is a type 2 action uh, for seeker purposes. Uh, with the applicant's consent, I would uh, move to table the application to the August meeting. Second.
Any discussion? All Jim, those. just a quick question on that. I know I'm killing people with the discussion no, here, but that's fine. Um, I don't usually uh, say too much in the discussion, but so like even if she got like the best possible locks, I mean I know we can't really do anything, and it's on her liability. But like, uh, I mean, if if the people that you know, because if it's a Airbnb or if it's a short term rental, like if they don't do anything like the cleaners and they don't like pick it up. I mean, you could have the best lock on the planet, but if someone doesn't lock it, it's not going to do its job. So, I mean, there's there's no recall. All we can just say is, okay, you, you know, you have the best possible locks approved by the pool company or the pool. There's nothing else we can do about that, correct? I, I wouldn't disagree with that. What I'm, what I'm hoping to find out in the, between now and August is what the what is the origin of the requirement about hot tubs and front yards? I suspect that it has to do with the attractive nuisance that a hot tub creates. Uh, and if it's in a backyard, that's much less visible, much less accessible than a front yard. Uh, and then would have to weigh against that the benefits of a hot tub in a climate like this versus uh, that preference uh, to avoid having attractive nuisances in front yards and the characterization of this as a front yard because of the water. So that's kind of why I wanted to adjourn. And if, if we accomplish nothing more than getting good locks put on it, I guess we've at least enabled some, some degree of benefit uh, if we're in the frame of mind that we're thinking we would be inclined to grant that. So um, that was my that was my thinking. I can say that when I do hot tub inspections, it's my job to make sure that there is lockable devices, and those click click in devices are acceptable. But in most cases, you have to understand that in most cases, people with hot tubs are fenced in, right. so they have a deterrent barrier already, and on top of that, then they have a locking cover. But there also are swivel arms that can be applied to covers to lock them. Well, you know, at uh, I think it was at Massawipi where I worked one time. We had something that would be very difficult to lock. But you put a uh, eye bolt on the two sides, and you run a chain, and you put a padlock on it, and you do that so that the cover can't come off. You know, it, it's possible to actually, I think we locked canoes uh, by lacing them together and, you know, with a chain and tying them, you know, padlocking them. So it's possible to, to lock a, a hot tub like that so that the lid can't be opened without taking off padlocks. It is possible, uh, more than just the clicking things. But, you know, it'll be interesting to see what she is able to do and then, um, perhaps you can next week or next month enlighten us as to the uh, rationale behind hot, no hot tubs in the front yards. So I suspect that it has to do with the attractive nuisance and... and I would uh, think so. Privacy matters. And privacy as well. Yeah, I, you know, that goes without no, saying. I can say that we, we can't be... We can be more restrictive than the New York State Code. But right. that would have to be voted in by the town board. Um, I could make it, I can always make a more restrictive action a condition of the permit. I can put it as a, a condition of the permit. Of the variance, if we granted a variance? Well, in my case, it'd be a permit that they would come to apply for okay. in a hot tub. And as a result of that application, I can put on there, one of the conditions is that you have a more secure locking device or something to that need. I mean, they all have to be UL listed anyways. Yeah. So. All right. Would so she, any other discussion? I just, would she be subject to electrical inspection and everything as well? Yes. Okay. Just wondering. All right. Any other discussion? All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 This is a, the motion to table. Any opposed? 
Any abstentions? Motion carries four votes in favor. No opposed, no abstentions. Two members of the board remain absent, and we continue to be short one member as we are constituted. The last item is the application pertaining to 3000 East Ridge Road. Um, we're not, this, this would be a type two action for seeker purposes. Um, we're not tabling it, we're continuing it. Is there a, I don't, I don't think we've ever, I think you can just, is there a distinction between, I mean, if you just table it and keep the public hearing open and. All right, so we'll table it. I'll make a motion to table it. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries, four votes in favor, no opposed, no abstentions. Two members of the board remain absent and we continue to be short one member as constituted. I believe that concludes all the business that we had before us this evening. So uh, I would move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Four votes in favor. Two opposed. No, or er, four votes in favor. No opposed. No abstentions. Two members remain absent, and we are short one member as presently constituted.